I'm Mayra Bubinich, and I'm just really delighted to welcome you here today on behalf of CDD, my colleague Charles Kenny, and my, my colleague Megan O'Donnell, who has organized this whole thing. So thank you, Megan. Uh, so this is sort of the first of a two-day event, and we are delighted to have two days at CDD on gender and development. And the, the events are focused on promoting gender equality and specifically women's economic empowerment. So this is the second annual, today is the second annual Birdsell House Conference on Women. And last year, the conference focused on aid approaches, and this year it's going to focus on beyond aid approaches to promoting gender equality. And it reflects, in part, what we have been doing in terms of research here at CDD. And it also, but also, and most importantly, it reflects really on the growing evidence base that is available on women's economic empowerment. And I'm so delighted to know that we, have, we are finally mainstreamed. And we finally have really rigorous evidence and wonderful examples to point to. So at CDD, and you'll hear about our work today and tomorrow also, we are focusing on women's economic opportunities, particularly on financial inclusion. Uh, also, we are looking at private sector codes of conduct, at trade and investment treaties and migration channels and other non-aid uh, tools. And also I recommend that you go in. We have proposals for the new White House. So on gender equality, you should go to our website and look at those as well. So, but I'm really excited to see all the array, different array of speakers that we have today, all the organizations, the private, the private sector and civil society. We have three topics in the session today. The first one is how to increase opportunities for women workers who are workers through local and global, local and global supply chains. And I mean, this is a really important session. I mean, when we talk about sort of beyond uh, aid, economic opportunities for women more broadly, a lot of time people think about private sector, uh, small enterprises, medium-sized enterprises, women in business, but we're starting with, he, with really where most of women workers are that are, are in the informal economy, in the grassroots, and I think that this, you're going to see just incredible work, particularly, let's say what Viego have done. So, and then we go to financial services, and finally, we will be looking at how policy making can play a role in engaging private sector actors to advance economic outcomes for women. So, and I will hope that you will join us tomorrow. Tomorrow we are in, in partnership with Data2x and the UN Foundation and IDRC. We are, be, we are going to be looking more specifically at women's economic empowerment, at an update to the roadmap on women's economic empowerment, and a whole session on measurement how do we measure particularly the subjective components of women's economic empowerment? So without further ado, I will turn it over this to Mr. Mohidin, who is the director of the Economic Empowerment Program at the US Chamber of Commerce to moderate the first session. Where are you? She. Sorry. OK. Thank you, Jan. It's supposed to turn it on in the back. I think I have it on now, right? Is this better? <laughs> okay, so the number. Let's give it another try. I'll just start speaking loudly. How about that? 
<laughs> we'll get going. Um, so I'm Shamaroot Mohiuddin. Thank you, Elizabeth. <laughs> I'm uh, the director of the Economic Empowerment Program at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation. And the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation has been very engaged on this particular issue for a while. Um, some of you might wonder, uh, what is the Chamber of Commerce doing? So the companies that we work with have been doing a lot in this space in terms of uh, enabling women, uh, providing access to resources in terms of finance and other tools, as well as uh, providing access to job opportunities, leadership opportunities with a specific gender focus. For a long time, companies haven't really taken a gender focus, but increasingly we're seeing that. So we're kind of a clearinghouse for best practices in this area and helping companies learn from each other um, and collaborate and co-invest in solutions, as well as uh, working with NGOs to leverage each other's resources, working with government to leverage public-private resources as well. Uh, so I'm thrilled to have today's panel. This is probably the most informed set of people on this issue of uh, women workers. So um, I'll kick off with uh, introducing each of them. Maybe my mic is on by this time, so Elizabeth, here you go. Uh, and then uh, we'd like you to say a little bit about the work that you're doing, and then maybe you could elaborate on your bio a little bit that way as well. Um, so our first speaker to my right is Elizabeth, Elizabeth Vasquez. Uh, she's the CEO and co-founder of WeConnect International, which is a corporate-led nonprofit that helps to empower women business owners to succeed in global markets. And Elizabeth is a serial social entrepreneur. Uh, this is not the first initiative she's started, um, and she's also a leading figure in the issue of supplier diversity and inclusion. Um, and Elizabeth also serves on the high-level UN panel on women's economic empowerment. And then following her, we have uh, next to her, Rina Nanavati. Uh, and Nina has uh, worked for a long time as the, um, one of the founders of the Sewa uh, organization in India, which is uh, the Self-Employed Women's Association and since 1984. And she stayed on to be elected as general secretary in 1999 and expanded vastly the membership of Sewa to new heights uh, and is now the single largest union of informal women workers in India. And then next to her is Jenny Greaser, um, who is a partner of ours as well. And uh, she's a senior director of women's economic empowerment for Walmart. Um, and Jenny has more than 30 years of experience in merchandising and sourcing. And she's been a passionate um, champion of this issue of women's economic empowerment within Walmart uh, and has really sort of held the, this pro the hand of this program to its fruition and now growing every year. Um, and then she's also a senior buyer um, in the home area of Walmart as well. And uh, Jenny's working very closely with WeConnect as well uh, in sourcing. And then following her, uh, we have Professor Marcus Chen, who's the lecturer in public policy at Harvard Kennedy School and also the affiliated professor at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. Um, and she's a leading researcher in this field. You, a lot of you may have read some of her work. And she also leads the Global Research Policy Action Network called WIEGO, which Myra recommended uh, earlier that you look into. So um, with that, you know, I'll go into the discussion uh, with uh, Elizabeth. Uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about what WeConnect does um, and how has it really been able to find these women-owned businesses around the world having a network um, in 100 different countries um, and really sort of identifying 51% women owned and managed businesses uh, and then also working with corporations to source from these women business owners. So, so thank you and thank you to uh, CGD for having this opportunity for all of us to be together. We're all friends um, and so many of you we get to work with. Uh, we Connect International, yes, is a nonprofit. Thrilled to work with the Chamber Foundation. Uh, because there is no one organization, as we all know, there's no one government or one corporation that can ensure women's economic empowerment. Uh, but I get to run a nonprofit that was created by the biggest buyers in the whole world. They spend a trillion dollars a year on products and services, and they spend about 1% of it with women-owned businesses. So if we want to talk about women's economic empowerment, we have to follow the money, and we have to understand how money flows, and we have to make sure that women are a part of creating the products and services and businesses uh, that we need for, the, for today and for the world that we all want. And so that's our job, is to connect supply with demand. The corporate members are looking for the best products and the best services. And they don't generally have access to women as suppliers. And so we get to work with uh, Walmart and the Sewas and the Wagos to identify women-owned businesses around the world, yes, in 100 countries now, they can self-register for free, and they can put online um, what products, what services they do, are they growing or not, do they have um, 
it, how many employees do they have? And so we're also, in, thanks to, you'll hear from IDRC tomorrow, trend analysis um, in, you know, are these companies growing? Are they starting to go into sectors that are more profitable? Um, so there's a lot more to be shared, but um, that's our job is to, to work with partners to find women-owned businesses, develop their capacity to compete and win business, certify that they are women-owned businesses because there's a lot of investors that want to invest and they want to make sure they're spending money with women-owned businesses, and then introduce them to actual buyers. Um, and the buyers are the ones that are created this network. So it's just a thrill to be a part of this conversation. And so we look forward to it being a very dynamic day. Thank you. Absolutely. So Elizabeth, thank you for that. Um, Jenny, we'll go to you. And if you could talk a little bit about the genesis of the Walmart uh, Women's Economic Empowerment Program. Why did Walmart decide to do this? Um, and also maybe a little bit about how you're able to champion this within the company and get the buy-in from the top level. Well, thank you. It's, a, it's really an honor to be here with this um, group and with all of you. Um, I lead the Women's Economic Empowerment Initiative for Walmart. Um, I've been with Walmart for 11 years, really coming in from the business side, came in as a senior buyer, and then was um, doing different jobs around uh, managing buyers or managing sourcing um, for buyers through uh, suppliers. And I've had the privilege of leading this Women's Economic Initiative, an um, empowerment initiative, for about the last two and a half years. And it was started uh, around 2011. Our CEO at the time, Mike Duke, made some publicly stated um, announcements around sourcing and training women. You know, we have uh, most of our, the majority of our customers are women. Uh, we have a supply chain that um, affects a lot of women. So how could we use our you know, business, uh, I should say what our core competency is, we, we buy a lot of goods. Um, and so we, you know, we sell a lot of goods, but we buy a lot of goods. So how can we use that, we call it the, you know, the power of the PO, the purchase order, or you know, working with um, our factories for women in our factories to start trying to empower them economically. So the goals that were made um, five years ago were, from a sourcing perspective, we said that here in the United States, we would source $20 billion from women-owned businesses in products or services. And in our international markets, uh, where we have um, many markets internationally, we would double our sourcing in those international markets with purchases from women-owned businesses. The other part of the initiative was around training. And we said we would train 1 million women, and the foundation would spend $100 million toward that training. And the training would be women in factories, women in agriculture, and getting women ready for their first job in, let's say, a retail sector, which in developing countries is um, quite uh, growing right now. So we're coming to the end of our five years, and we're doing very well with those goals. We, are, we definitely will make the $20 billion goal in the US, which is um, really fabulous. And um, we're um, getting ready to celebrate that. The international goal, we're making some really good progress in some of our international markets. We still have, and we'll probably talk a little bit later, the, the challenge of even, even kind of um, how do you identify um, who the women-owned businesses are, because in some markets it's still the measurement part of it, identification and measurement is still uh, difficult to do. But we, we go around and we try to see what are the barriers that women have in uh, doing business with Walmart, and how do we try to level the playing field with, for them within our corporation. And that might mean changing some of the different processes that we have for bringing them you know, on board, identifying what their needs are and building capacity training programs for them, um, which you know, SEWA has been um, involved with. So we're, we're looking at, we realize that it's, you know, there's going to take multiple partners to make any kind of systemic change which is why we you know, rely on uh, WeConnect International to help us with the identification, the ecosystem, in some cases the training um, of the women-owned businesses. Um, but there's going to need to be a more you know, collective action, um, I think, within you know, public, private sector mm -hmm. in order to really start to see change. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, so Marty, we'll go to you. I think you wanted to show, show some data. Um, do we have the slides up yet? They were up. <laughs> Somebody? There they are. Okay. Um, yeah. 
And uh, if you could talk a little bit about what the informal economy looks like. I mean, not every uh, woman is part of the formal sector, and especially not in developing countries. Um, so how big is the informal sector in terms of women's employment in it, in, in the countries that you studied? Uh, what does it look like in terms of women's involvement in different sectors as well? So if you could talk a bit about that. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and thanks to uh, Myra and Megan and Nancy for inviting all of us. I work, um, as does Rima Ben, with uh, women informal workers. So I'm shifting the focus to the base of the uh, women's workforce, the base of the economic pyramid. And this slide is just to show that uh, women informal workers uh, tend to work in non-standard workplaces. Yes, there are some in factories and firms and hotels and restaurants, but most of them are working in uh, private homes or in small workshops that are in informal settlements, and many of them are working in public space, on the streets, in open spaces, or in the rural areas with our natural resources. And the, one of the biggest threats to them is that they get um, evicted from public space or from natural resources or they get excluded if they live and work in informal settlements from um, secure tenure, from basic infrastructure services. So the workplace itself is one of the sources of disadvantage for these women. I also wanted to share a data slide just to say that the majority of women workers uh, in the developing world and an increasing share in the developed are informally employed. So if we look at um, the lowest incidence is in the MENA region, but we know the data is probably not right. Um, it's more than half of women workers in Latin America. It's two-thirds of women workers in Southeast and East Asia. It's, if you include South Africa, it's 75%, three-quarters in Africa. But if you take away South Africa, it would be more like South Asia, where it's more than 80% of women workers are informally employed. And then I just wanted to share this um, figure. The pyramid shows different statuses of employment uh, in the informal economy, but they also are categories of employment more generally. And what we know globally for all women is half of all women workers are self-employed. Half of all men workers are also self-employed. But what we also know within the self-employed is that of all women workers in the world, only 1% are employers. All right, only 1%. 3% of men are. Um, what we have as a reality is that 30% of women self-employed, or 30% of all women among the self-employed are own account operators, which means they run a, um, a small family unit or they're a single person operator. They do not hire others. And then another 20% of women workers um, are what are called unpaid contributing family workers. So they're working in the small family firm or on the family farm. So when we think about women self-employed, we really do have to think about the ones who are on their own or in the family uh, units. And one more slide. I was also has to say a few words about the network um, that I co-founded with Sewa and um, have been leading for 20 years. <laughs> um, and WeGo is a global, we call it an action research policy network, part social movement because we uh, find and network and build the capacity of organizations of informal workers. We're part think tank because we do very serious statistical work to get the kind of data that I just showed you and we do research as well. And then we're an advocacy network that does policy analysis and policy advocacy, but with a difference. We do the advocacy with the organizations of workers. So a recent, most recent example is that we were in Quito 
Ecuador for Habitat 3, the big UN summit. And we had a delegation of 12 informal worker leaders. And what we did was help facilitate their access to speak in different sessions, in press conferences. And we helped them uh, with uh, preparing their presentations with interpretation and, um, and also equipping them with the knowledge they needed to make the points about the size and significance of their work. Uh, we work with four sectors, domestic workers, home-based workers, street vendors, and waste pickers. And I'm happy to say that there are national, regional, or, and or international alliances in all these sectors. And these networks between them have um, 158 affiliate organizations in 84 countries. So they are becoming increasingly organized, uh, the informal workforce. Uh, and just to end with what we think are the key enabling conditions for women to be economically empowered if they're at the base of the pyramid. And the first is increased voice. And by voice, we mean collective voice. So they need to be organized and they need to have um, a seat at the policy table. And Elizabeth and I have been in discussions at the UN panel on women's economic empowerment that for the own account producers um, to be linked to supply chains, they also need to be organized. Because an individual, it's very hard to link up to a supply chain. But if they are producer groups or co-ops, then they too can be linked. Uh, the second increased V is visibility. And statistics are hugely important. And statistics in the hands of workers it represents power. And so we're very dedicated to improving statistics and research. And the third V <laughs> is validity. Um, just like women's work is undervalued, the work of informal workers is undervalued. So they face a double jeopardy. And informal work is stigmatized around the world as somehow illegal, criminal, gray, black, underground. And what we're trying to show is that majority of informal workers are working poor, trying to earn an honest living under very harsh uh, policy and legal conditions. Thank you. Thank you, Marty. So it's a nice segue into uh, Seva's work. Rima, if you could talk a little bit about Seva's work in India specifically, and also examples that uh, you would highlight that others could learn from, from Seva's work. Namaste, and I represent here some two million uh, women workers. Uh, very different from what my friends have been talking. I, re I represent here the what Marty was calling the base, but we call them as the wheels of the pyramid, the, real, the women workforce in our country. And 93% of the workforce in our country is from the informal sector. So way back in 1972, our founder, Ila Bhatt, um, she um, <coughs> found out that these women need to be organized so that you know their work gets recognized as work. And the issues that the women have around their work also get visibility. And that's how SEVA was founded. We come together as women, as workers, and as poor no matter what caste, community, or religion um, these women and as workers belong to. And um, I think um, at SEVA, we very firmly believe, as our founder says, that poverty is also a worst form of violence with the consent of the society. And um, our fight is not against an employer or against a contractor or against the government, but our biggest fight is against poverty. And how do we collectively organize and collectively fight against poverty? And our experience of over four decades now has shown that when women have work and income security, that's the economic security, they are able to fight against the very many vulnerabilities that are created by the society or you know, by the invisibility of their work. And it helps the women earn the dignity and the self-respect um, that the women need. We call it as the economic freedom 
for the women which is the freedom from hunger and starvation um, it uh, gives the freedom uh, of choice to the women and she no longer feels vulnerable and um, so we work on a very integrated approach uh, organizing we feel is the key and the surest way um, but along with organizing how do we work on asset creation be it in the form of savings for the women or be it having access to licenses to do certain kinds of trades or be it access to tools and equipments then the next important thing is capacity leadership capabilities managerial skills and capabilities and then having access to the basic support services which is healthcare, childcare, nutrition, and shelter. When all these things come together, then women are able to demand. They are able to speak up, be it in their own family, be it in their own community, or in front of a contractor, or a trader, or a village headman. And this in itself becomes an empowering process for the women. So today we have uh, around 2 million women workers in India. Uh, we work, we were founded from Gujarat, and so we work on the Gandhian values and principles of truth and nonviolence um, um, and equal respect to uh, all the members of SEVA. But we also work in the regions. So we work in Afghanistan, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Bhutan, and Myanmar as well. And uh, as we all know, in countries like ours, there's surplus of labor and less of employment opportunities. And in order for women to experience the economic freedom, to have experience of the economic security, um, we try to create alternative economic opportunities for the women. And how do you bring them into the value, um, into the mainstream of the economy? And in order to do that, it calls for building up the value chains or supply chains, which are owned and managed by the women workers themselves. So we are a family of organization today um, with women having their own uh, economic organizations, having their own marketing organizations in agriculture, in textiles and garments, in construction, in waste recycling. And that's where we partner with friends like Elizabeth and Jenny and where, you know, Vigo was created by Seva together with Marty at Harvard um, because we experience that, you know, it's in order to be into the mainstream and to be recognized, we really need um, good data and evidence. And I think um, that's what we are trying to do with uh, Vigo as well. Um, so I'll end here. Um. And, um, uh, thanks, Rima. Uh, I think you also raised an issue that everyone's sort of tackling, which is we, uh, how can we get our hands on the right data? Um, mm -hmm. So uh, I think for Elizabeth too, uh, I know that WeConnect um, has tried to capture the data around the rate of growth of the women-owned businesses and uh, to what extent are they able to access finance, um, mm -hmm. those kinds of uh, points of data that really help define the solutions. So I was wondering if you're doing some work around sort of seeing um, what kind of businesses are growing and what are those enabling factors that allow the women of businesses to grow uh, in the countries that you're working in. I'm sure policy has a big role to play here as well, so feel free mm -hmm. to comment on that. Um, and then anything you can say about just sort of how they grow and also connect to uh, global supply chains in a more effective way. Sure. So it is interesting after having worked with many of the biggest companies in the world for several years now, um, there are certainly challenges to getting into these global value chains, huge challenges that, that have to be addressed so that there's equal opportunity for anyone who has an innovation um, that will uh, be used by uh, individuals or by corporations. So there is a lot of work to be done. But we're finding that a lot of the women in businesses just aren't thinking big enough. They don't, it doesn't occur to them to knock on the door of Walmart to try to sell a product or service or to Marriott or to Pfizer or any number of large, or the government, local governments. The biggest buyers of products and services in the world are usually federal governments. And the women just generally aren't doing uh, public procurement. They're not trying to get these contracts. And there are a lot of reasons for that. Um, a lot of times I think it, it either doesn't occur to them or, or if it does occur to them, they simply don't have the right knowledge or the right networks because they haven't been a part of that infrastructure historically. Um, and that's where I think uh, 
disruptive innovation comes in, and, and that's, I think, an opportunity, right? It's not, it's not the challenge, it's the opportunity to deliver things that underutilized groups haven't been a part of to make things better than what the way they're working now. And so I think by building more inclusive value chains um, locally, within communities, nationally, and globally, we have a huge opportunity in front of us to really change things in a way that will be better for the people. If the people are involved in actually delivering those innovations, the products and the services, I genuinely believe the world will be a better place. If women are no longer invisible in these global value chains along the entire value chain, whether it's from the informal sector or as employer or employees or as employers, we desperately need them to be more successful and we need to have consciousness of how we as consumers spend our money. And if any of that money is going to communities that we care about, whether it's um, social or the environment or holding ourselves and each other accountable for good governance and transparency. So, but we don't have a lot of data. I mean, honestly, there's very little out there about women business owners as employers, as you noted, Marty, there just aren't that many. And it's not that women don't want to be employers. I think many millions of them are, and many millions more want to be, and they are the small business engine of growth. So if you're in India and you're collecting data, the Micro, Small, and Medium Enterprise Agency is one of the only governments in the world that collects sex disaggregated data on their um, businesses. And so they know that women-owned businesses, when compared to male-owned businesses, holding things constant for size and industry sector, Women in India who own businesses employ more people than male-owned businesses. So if you're the government of India, where do you think you should be investing your time and your resources? But no one knows that in other countries because no one's collecting this kind of, no one's asking these very simple but absolutely critical questions about who are these small businesses? Who are these in the informal sector that if only they had the um, resources and the support and the education and the access to the networks could become a part of the formal sector if they wanted to be. Not all of them want to be, but if they do want to be, and we desperately need them to be, we need to do a better job of creating an ecosystem approach, right? It can't be access to finance alone or access to markets alone. You can't just educate people and expect them to be able to start and grow businesses. It's this holistic approach that I think you're hearing and that Walmart saw firsthand. Walmart can only do so much. They are one of, they are one of the biggest, one, of, one or two, you go back and forth with ExxonMobil. Companies in the world, $20 billion they spent with women-owned businesses over the last five years. Tell me, show me one government or one multilateral that has spent $20 billion with women in the last five years. So we have to do a better job of leveraging this private sector commitment to leverage, to use that purchasing power to not just invest, but it's a sustainable way of getting huge amounts of money into the hands of women in our lifetime and then allowing those women to employ people and train people and do all the things that we desperately need to be done to make this a, a better world for all of us. So I think we have to think of it as a, as a value chain that, that you can't just do one and not do the other. So this ecosystem Definitely. approach mm -hmm. and the data to support it, to show what's working and what's not is critical. Mm -hmm. And speaking of uh, training and employing, um, uh, Jenny, uh, are you working with other stakeholders, NGOs perhaps, or, or governments in terms of really building the pipeline for women-owned businesses, um, and mm -hmm. how are you doing that? What's the process? Yes, we, we partner um, quite a bit with um, different uh, people, depending on um, the market, if their goals align with our goals, if they have a core competency around the training that we're looking at, if they've got a proven track record. Um, so certainly, you know, we've been working with uh, Sewa in India on some retail training um, that's been going on there. We work with uh, TechnoServe quite a bit in Mexico, Mexico USAID. Um, you know, so we, we yes, we have some really, really great partners, um, and we've learned quite a bit. You know, as as we go along uh, with that, that you know, Walmart, especially in our international markets, you really need people who have you know kind of that boots on the ground, people who are there and understand the culture and the ecosystem, and can help us with a curriculum. Um, around the training and um, around the measurement of that training. Mm -hmm. So yes, we definitely um, look at trying to partner you know, with multiple 
um, stakeholders sometimes to get an initiative uh, finished in one of our markets. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then also as an extension of that, um, do you feel that uh, the company is lending its in-house expertise? Because I hear a lot in terms of the context of public-private partnerships to support women or entrepreneurs in general is that oftentimes companies are seen as a source for funding generally mm -hmm. right. um, through their foundations right. or philanthropic programs. So are you, um, through your scientists who might be working you know, with the agricultural sector right. um, in Latin America, for example, or uh, with your uh, protocol officers that are working on cross-border trade documents to make sure that trade yes. happens. Um, are you lending that kind of internal expertise that's the core competence of the company? Yeah, definitely. We look at, you know, we have some programs that are like train the trainer. So we have, you know, um, some, certain people who are doing um, a curriculum, train other NGOs and other people within that market. We also try to take best practices that we've learned in one market and implement them in another market. Um, we have some great research that we have done through Tufts University on our factory and in, in women in factory training. Um, we just did a, um, a meeting last week with CSIS with some other people who've been really active in this space and starting to try to share those types of learnings and what can we do as a corporation to go back and make some changes that will help um, get this training in more factories because we're starting to see that it is affecting how men are perceiving women and how women are perceiving themselves and the actual productivity of the factory itself. So that's the, you know, the type of business case that lends itself to now becoming more sustainable when you start to see that social and business, that shared value um, results from some of this. So we definitely look to share um, our learnings. As you said, we're one of the biggest um, as far as procurement um, sourcing from women um, in the world. And over the past five years, we've learned a lot over about what it takes um, from a corporation side and what it takes from a supplier side in order to be ready to do business with a corporation. So for instance, we um, tried to do business with really small artisan types of uh, businesses, bringing it in through our dot-com, trying that model. And I'll be very honest, I mean, we did not do well with that. Um, we found that there were a lot of um, issues trying to do business, a corporation with really small artisan types of base of the pyramid businesses. And we found that there are some key success factors that a corporation has to have and a business has to have in order to make that happen. Um, they have to have, number one, it's, um, it has to be a product that is more mass appeal. You know, we found that fashion types of products or niche types of products, they just didn't have the, um, you know, the demand from a U.S. market to, you know, to keep it going, where something like cashews or coffee does. So you know, we, we were successful in those types of, of things. Or if the supplier doesn't have, let's say, a, a good quality control to really be able to look at what is the quality of the product that they're shipping. And sometimes, um, you know, to give an example, we were buying horn bracelets. And you know, the bracelets could be this big or this big because you know, you're talking about a horn. So you know, when you get bracelets that are this big, um, you know, it, it's, it's difficult to sell. <laughs> So we learned a lot. You know, we, we kind of laugh at some of the um, how naive we were when we started out. But we did find that you know when you do go through collectives and you know you can get um, women together. You know, we're doing that quite a bit in our uh, women farmers and uh, in in India, where we've got collectives of of women that come together. And then yes, they can eliminate the, the middleman, if you will, and go directly to a corporation. But you have to really find those um, those collectives or use the right aggregator um, in order to make that happen to come into a, a, a corporation uh, type of atmosphere. Sure. Um, and then Rima, I wanted to come back to you about um, how you're actually identifying the women in the informal economy. Um, Elizabeth's sort of doing that in the formal sector, finding those uh, women-owned businesses that are majority women-owned, because that's also a difficult process to ascertain sometimes. Um, so are the women coming to you in India? In a lot of cases, I guess, now Sewa is pretty well established, um, but you're also working in other countries. Are they coming for that kind of support? And also, uh, in addition to that, what kind of sectors are they normally in? Um, and what kind of um, policy issues are they seeking help with? Um, what kind of you know, voice and visibility issues as well? So I think to... Um 
supplement to what Elizabeth was saying and what Jenny is saying. I think seva is women and women is seva. So mm -hmm. it's not that seva is something and the women are approaching seva, but who makes seva? It's the women themselves who make up seva. And um, I think that's what is the core or the fundamental, the ownership. And unless and until it's, there's a strong sense of ownership and belongingness, um, I don't think that you know very many uh, private sector companies would be able to really mm -hmm. partner. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we all need to understand that you know it is unless and until you identify what are the issues that the women are grappling with mm -hmm. in the different trades that they are or what are their needs in order for them to strengthen their earnings and you know optimize their productivity because who are the women that i'm representing today these are the women who are scattered who either work out of their homes or they work on the streets they have worn out tools and equipments they are not really having the latest you know state of the art technology to mm -hmm. having access to that who do not know where the raw material comes from or you know where the goods that they manufacture or the services that they are offering really who are the end users of it and it is these women who need to be organized mm -hmm. so let me give you an example I don't know how much time you're giving me but I'll be very fast <laughs> and um, <laughs> and because I've come all the way from India so maybe yeah, you you <laughs> <laughs> to bring the voices of those women. So, uh, um, you know, um, talking about artisans that Jenny was talking about, mm -hmm. and, you know, these are some of the traditional skills that the women have. But when it was in the early 80s that, you know, I was moving around in the desert villages, and I saw that every household had a woman who could embroider. This was a traditional skill, and yet these women were all working on the earth digging sites, mm -hmm. earning. 75 rupees, Indian rupees, which is just slightly above a dollar uh, per month, not even a day, but this was just per month. And, um, you know, they had the traditional skill, but they were not using it as a means of livelihoods or for earning. And talking of linking those women to companies like Walmart or, you know, <laughs> what are we talking about? So what does it require? So I think uh, the first time I went to a woman called Puri Ben and I asked her that if she was willing to work, I would bring them, you know, garments to embroider. And they were skeptical that what is this woman from a young woman from a city? Is she going to change our lives? This was the skill that we had generations after generations, and yet we have not been able to use it. But five women came together. And when they started embroidering the garments, the ones like what I'm wearing today, and they earned 500 rupees a month against what they were earning only 75 rupees, the word spread around and next time around, more and more women started coming together. And in two years time, we had 15,000 women who were just, you know, and if that is the only source of income and livelihood, I, we can no longer run it as a program. Mm -hmm. It called for how, what kind of an organization you need to be. How do you bring them into the market? What is the kind of supply chain that's required? What are the operations that need to be centralized? And what are the operations that the women would do sitting at home? And there's no model that's available in the whole world that you could take and, you know, you had to evolve your own models. And that's what is mm -hmm. the biggest learning, that when you want informal sector women workers to be brought into the whole value chain or supply chain, it's a process. <laughs> and we all need to invest mm -hmm. time and resources both in that process, because you have to evolve your own model of supply chain. Mm -hmm. Today, we have 30,000 women artisans all in their own company. We call it as the Seva Trade Facility. They have their own profit centers where they partner with private sector companies. We partner with the GAPs. We partner with the Primarks. And you know they produce for them. But it's a process. It took almost about a decade for us. And when these women had secured work and income, 
it was this coming together that gave them the confidence that they could do that. And now these women who earlier were digging, uh, going and w digging on the sites, they have assets, they have house, they have farms, they have tractors, and then they didn't want their men to be sitting idle. <laughs> so they, they found out that water was a big issue for them. And these women took it up on themselves to, you know, how do they bring water to their villages? And for that, they needed support of the government, for the village headmen, and the support was not easy to come from the men. They were scorned and they were, you know, pushed back. But we all know that we women, when we come together, we are a persistent force, you know. And finally, the women started, you know, bringing water pipelines, roof rainwater harvesting structures, and that made the agriculture, you know, revive in those villages. So what I'm trying to say is that when women are economically secured, mm -hmm. they're not only able to, you know, the dynamics in the families change, but they set in motion a whole process of transformation of the communities and of the region mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. And, and Marty, I, I know you were uh, maybe uh, thinking of making a comment based on Rima's remarks, but I know you've studied uh, this issue a lot in terms of the sector informal yeah. economy and how it differs from different country to country. So have you seen um, in any country a kind of big transition from the informal economy into the formal sector? And is that something that's desirable or is it <laughs> That's a good question, right? Depends what you mean. <laughs> um, first, I just wanted to say one thing about supply chains, and then I can come to the formula. In global supply chains, you can have women-owned enterprises, right? You can have the collectives that Rima and Seva have worked so mm -hmm. long and hard to get. But a large percent, and you can have the factory workers. But then there's another group that I just wanted to highlight. And these are women who are industrial outworkers. They work under a subcontract and are paid by the piece. And they work from their home, right? Mm -hmm. And I would venture that probably the largest numbers of women involved in global supply chains are of this kind, <laughs> at least in the garment textile ones. And I just want to highlight in two issues. One has to do with the supply chain dynamics. The other has to do with government, OK? Mm -hmm. They're working in their home. Right, in often slum or squatter settlements. And they have no housing tenure, so it's very hard. There are no incentives to invest in the home to make it a better, more productive workplace. And because they're in informal settlement, they probably are not getting the basic infrastructure services that would make their work home from workplace more productive. So we have to bring in the public sector as well, even in global supply chains. Um, so I think that's really important to keep in mind. In terms of the value chain dynamics, um, this is a plea for the home workers of the world. They get paid less than the factory workers, even in the same chain. So we've done some, Samin did some her mother-in-law and I worked together <laughs> on that in Bangladesh. Okay, so they get paid less than the factory workers. Um, but this is really the problem. They provide the workplace, the equipment, they pay for the electricity, and they pay for their transport. So if they have to pay transport to get the raw materials to their home and, fin and the finished goods back, we did a study in three Asian cities. A third of them operate at a loss, right? So when we think about how to set their piece rate, it has to be above the minimum wage because they absorb so much of the costs and, and also the risks. They can be left high and dry with work orders finished and nobody takes them. For, so I just wanted to point out the lowest chain in the global supply chain. We really have <laughs> to spend more time looking at it. Now, formalization. <laughs> I teach a course at the Kennedy School at Harvard called The Informal Economy, colon, Is Formalization the Answer? Question mark. Okay? So the basic answer is it depends what you mean, right? Now, integrating into a global supply chain uh, could be one step towards formalization. 
and maybe they'd like it, but they'd like it on favorable terms. Mm -hmm. So if it's on favorable terms, the integration, yes, we want formalization. Mm -hmm. But if you ask them, the workers, what they want by way of formalization, all of them want, first and foremost, that validity question that I raised. They want legal identity and recognition as workers. They want the dignity that comes with being recognized mm -hmm. as workers. Two, they want social protection because by definition they do not have it. Third, they want the basic infrastructure and transport services from government. And four, they want organization and voice, right? And then if you break it down by sector, it's different. So the street vendor wants a secure place to vend. The waste picker wants um, access to waste, which is a public good. And they would like to be able to bid through their cooperatives. Again, it has to be a collective for government procurement bids for solid waste management, right? So what happens when cities sit up and modernize? They forget that waste pickers have been cleaning the streets and our environmental agents that reclaim waste for industrial purposes. And they give the contract, they privatize solid waste management to garbage companies that don't reclaim and recycle waste. Um, so there's, we have to, in each sector, see what's all the negatives that they face, mm -hmm. right? We call it reducing the negatives and enhancing the po positives. And we even sing the song about, and don't bother with Mr. In Between, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So uh, but we sing this song in our, <laughs> in, uh, there is a song about <laughs> the negatives and the positives. And what the informal workers face, and this is a plea to gender specialists. If you're an informal women worker, worker, which is the majority, you don't face just gender discrimination. You face discrimination because you're a home-based worker, because you're a street vendor, because you're a waste picker, because you're a construction day laborer. We have to look at both the worker identity and the gender identity, and then also the fact that they live and work often in informal settlements. They are from disadvantaged communities. So when we think about women's economic empowerment, we have to look at all three sources of women's discrimination or, or lack of power. Mm -hmm. So thank you. That was very comprehensive. Lots of things to think about. Um, <laughs> and uh, I wanted to open it up to questions. I know uh, people in the audience will have very good questions as well. Um, and uh, we can come back for some final thoughts later, sure. but maybe we can Start right there. If you could introduce yourself as well, that would be great. I think her, and then we'll come to you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Uh, thank you for your wonderful presentation. My name is Rosemary Seguero. I'm, I'm um, a president of a company called Seguero's International Group. We focus on uh, capacity building and also working with SMEs and the big companies, trying to make sure the big companies work with the small companies to grow. The small companies are not employees for, for the big companies. What we need them to do is to subcontract the small companies. And that's where women need to be because the big companies don't want. So how do we work with the, all of you? <laughs> the university, the Walmart, I met the president last year for Walmart and we discussed the, what we are talking today. Mm -hmm. So how do we work with you in training, in our vocational training, I'm based in Kenya in Western Kenya in the rural area, that's where I work. I call my public partnership with for poor people, the rural area, no agriculture. And agriculture is what they have lived on. So a lot can be done by agriculture, exporting to the US and nationally for fighting forward. So how do we partner with you guys as a company that is focusing on women, SMEs, and young people to make what you are talking uh, really act or impact? So thank you so much. We'll, we'll take two questions at a time. So if you could pass the mic to the woman behind you. Thank you. Sorry, uh, it's very difficult to hear with these microphones. I don't know if you're finding that. Um, my name is Rend Rahim. Uh, I am president of the Iraq Foundation. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. Uh, in a short time, I've learned a great deal. Um, it's been stimulating, provocative, and informative. So thank you. Um, I think, Rima, you mentioned changing family dynamics. 
And uh, the Iraq Foundation, part of the work it does is uh, livelihood for women. Um, we tend to focus on female heads of households, widows, but not exclusively. And we tra train them on small vocational work, uh, artisanal work, and so on. And as you say, most of them are in the informal market, work from home. But I wanted to go back to this changing the, the family dynamics, and I want to ask all the speakers uh, about the attitudes of men in those households and how men react to the training and the enabling of their women folk. Because often what we're dealing with, say, is families, even though we may deal with female heads of households, there's always a, a, a brother or an uncle and so on. And, and they're not just female heads of households, sometimes they're married women. But they're all from very poor backgrounds they're all from traditional conservative backgrounds and very patriarchal. And sometimes we worry about resistance from the males in the family. So have you had such experience? How have you dealt with it? Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> well, Jenny, maybe we'll go okay, to I'll first. Okay, I'll, yeah. um, I'll start with that one first, and then I'll, I'll try to answer quick. So I think what we found was that you do have to train the men as well. So in our factory training of women, um, we found that we trained the supervisors and the managers that it was um, much more effective and it started to change the way the men perceived even their wives at home and um, you know their, their perception of women in general. So it is a, I think you have to bring the men along. Um, but I think what you talk about as far as women starting businesses in some cultures where they're still expected to um, you know, take care of the children, do all the cooking, do all the cleaning, do all the household. It's hard to start a business when you're, you know, responsible for all that. So th there are other interventions that need to happen as far as training. Um, I think when we do the, uh, some of the capacity training that we do with our women-owned businesses in markets, we train the families. So we bring the families in because this is going to affect, you know, the kids' lives, the husbands, if they're, if they're you know, um, if the woman of the family who has the business decides she wants to scale it and she wants to grow it, there, it is going to impact the family dynamic. And, you know, someone may have to start doing a little bit more of the, um, you know, housework or someone might have to, I mean, so it does change that. And you do have to do that kind of training um, to make it, um, you know, to make it work. And then to address yours as far as how do you get access to, you know, how do you work with, you know, corporations or, I think what, what we look at within our markets is we always start with what is the business need. So for instance, in our um, India market, um, where are they going to be building stores? Um, what, is, what are the product categories that they're going to be um, needing to have new supply base or, or that they need more, um, you know, more into their supplier matrix? So we really look at it from what's the business need first, and then we reach out to see who in that particular market um, can help us find uh, women-owned businesses that will meet that particular business need, and what are the um, trainings that these particular women are going to need? Do they need training in financial acumen? Do they need training in production planning? Do they need training in you know d the different things? And then we partner with the different people who have expertise within that particular training. So it really, for us, starts with what's the business need within the market. And for instance, in Kenya, uh, I think we just have one store in Kenya. Um, we have Mass Mart, which is in um, South Africa. Um, so we don't have a lot of, um, when, we, when we deal, especially within, within Africa, it's the transporting goods um, that tends to be a problem. It's that logistics of trying to get goods from one country within Africa uh, to another, if we're talking about doing a local market in South Africa, which tends to be the easiest way for women-owned businesses to start, is to start within their local market, you know, that, that and then grow from there. Everyone wants to ship the United States because it's 4,000 stores, and you're like, you know, you see the light bulbs, and the, you know, that's gonna be awesome, I'm gonna, but it's really best to start small and local, and then grow. And in your particular case, because in Kenya, we don't have a lot of local market, it, it becomes a little more difficult. Not that it's impossible, it just becomes a little more difficult. Does that answer your question? Thank you. 
And if others want to respond to those questions as well. Um, I would just go to both the questions, but first to your question. And I think at SEVA we take family as a unit of organizing, but it's under women's leadership. Um, but definitely um, there's going to be a lot of resistance. And to the artisans example that I was talking about, there was so much of resistance even for women to leave their houses and go for trainings or go for marketing. Um, so much so that, you know, once when the women had an order and um, there is normally a caste panchayat that meets, that's a caste council, and it's all men who meet and um, meet and women have to cook. And this time the women had an order and so they refused to cook and they said that, you know, we have this order to meet with, so could you ask somebody else to cook? <laughs> and the men felt so offended and hurt that how can women refuse to cook when this was an age-old tradition? So they put a ban on women doing this embroidery work. And, um, you know, but when women start earning hard cash income, mm -hmm. it's that that changes the family mm -hmm. dynamics. So today, um, you know, we don't really advocate like a feminist organization that no, no, the roles have to change. But today it's the same men who take care of the household chores, you know, fetching water or cooking. When the women are going out for meetings or for marketing or for trainings or for organizing women in other states or in other countries. And when the meeting is happening, you, you would suddenly observe that men are serving tea which normally is what women are supposed to be doing. But, you know, I think it's, it's this economic security that the women bring into the household mm -hmm. which changes the dynamics. Mm -hmm. And that's how the process of transformation mm -hmm. starts. And to your question, sister, I think when it comes to agriculture, um, we, our experience has been very different, that the margins in agriculture and commodity trading are really, really very small. So what we did was rather than say procuring and selling it to you know large corporations or companies, we designed a whole rural distribution network. We partnered with the Unilever of India, the Hindustan Unilever, and we asked them to design a whole rural distribution network. So we procure from very, very small and marginal farmers. We grade it, process it, package it, and redistribute it in the villages. Because in countries like ours, food security is still a very big issue. So how do you ensure food security at the household level to the women, but you also give fair returns to the farmer and that strengthens the rural local economy. So I think that's what is needed when it comes to agriculture supply chain. You have your own distribution network. Only when you have surplus, you look for plugging into a larger supply chain of a large corporation. So I think... Um, Elizabeth, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I just try to address both of them. Um, we've found because our corporate members want to be sure that if they're going to, the CEO is going to stand up and say we buy from women, they want to be sure that that's actually a true statement. So that 51% ownership of a company and management and control is really important. And I think that has a lot of social implications because generally speaking, I can't tell you how many women I have met in every region of the world that frankly don't know if they own their company or not or how much of the company they own. Now it's different, if you're a sole proprietor, you own it, right? But so many in the world have family businesses. Their father owns half, or their brother owns half, or their husband owns half, or they own more than that, but the woman is doing all the business. The challenge with this is, and this is why asset ownership for women is so incredibly low. No one knows what the actual number is, but I can promise you it is really, really low, which makes it hard to build assets if you don't have them in the first place. Um, so in terms of business ownership, while it's not the answer for everyone, it is one of the best ways for women to become knowledgeable about the importance of asset ownership and how to build that. And so when they have at 50-50, having a certification that allows them access to the biggest corporations in the world is one of the first times in human history that women have a great economic reason to go to the men in their lives and say, look, I just need one more percent. I need to have control. You know, well, for 1%, we can get these contracts. You know I'm running the business anyway. I'm managing it. I'm controlling it. 
And I know you're offended that I'm asking this, but look, we're all gonna be better off if the asset ownership reflects how this business is actually being run. And so I think there's just some interesting levers that we can start to pull if we really want to focus on asset ownership wealth not redistribution, I think it's creating additional wealth that wasn't there before. So I think as long as we're not doing things that come across as taking things from men, but that men will be better off if women have more an equal opportunity to do things. Um, so they can self-register for free. We have lots of businesses from Kenya in our database. And this is the first database of across 100 countries where buyers can go in and look for peanuts or look for shea butter or look for PR services or construction services or uh, textiles, whatever it is, we try to make it really easy for supply and demand to connect. And I think that's one of the keys is to make this as easy as possible. And some of our best champions in this network are the men. The men who run um, sourcing, who are chief procurement officers, who feel that it is an opportunity to change communities, to change um, their base, like they're not doing this just for CSR reasons. They are wanting to have a stronger economy so they can sell stuff, they can employ more and better educated, healthier people. Um, and so this is good for everyone. We just have to be clear and we have to start doing a better job of documenting the ripple effects of, of all of this work, that it's, it's in the men's interest for us to all contribute more. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll go here, um, I don't know if Someone has a mic on this side, and then I think Emily in the back for a question. Thank you very much. Thank Working. you very much for giving me the opportunity. May I take this opportunity to congratulate you most sincerely uh, for all that you are doing and all that you say today. Can you hold it closer? Closer? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to take this opportunity. My name is Joyce Banda. I'm the former president of the Republic of Malawi. I'm serving here as a distinguished fellow researching on girls' education. <laughs> but all my life, I've been doing, this is where I started from. And I just wanted to put a human face to what is being discussed here. In 1990, the uh, USID sponsored me to go to Grameen Bank and to Sewa, <laughs> and attached me to Miss Elabat. She's the one who trained me. And I went back home and designed our own program, microfinance, believing that economic empowerment is key to social and political empowerment. And I moved from there to go to parliament, pursuing the same issues, assisting women, passing laws, and went to become my minister of women and children in my country, foreign minister, vice president, and president of the republic. <laughs> so you tell, tell, tell Sewa <laughs> that this is a problem. <laughs> The question that I had, I still continue with the work. I started by, as you know, mobilizing inf women in the informal sector, reached 1.3 million women in Malawi, built three schools, sent wow. 3,500 students wow. to school, 500 in university. Now we are trying to go and work in Nigeria. The question that I had was similar to the one my sister from Kenya asked, and it was well answered. Thank you very Thank much you. for this opportunity, and congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> So if we could go there, and then we'll come back to the side of the room. Thank you. Um, I think Emily and then uh, the lady in the back row. Thank you. Um, well, I don't think you can get much better than the ripple effect of the power of empowering women than, than President Bonda's story. But um, hi, I'm Emily Pryor, and I'm executive director of Data2x, which is a, a civil society, global gender data, uh, technical and advocacy partnership platform. Um, and on this topic of ripple effects and of documenting, um, Elizabeth, as you said, the, the ripple effects of, of this information, you cited some information from India about um, you know, SME data and that women-owned businesses are employing ma more than male-owned businesses and that therefore, um, from a policy perspective, that governments should be investing in those businesses to have, you know, the greatest impact on the most numbers of people. So what I'm wondering um, from both you and from Rima is, did that happen, right? So the data was there, was there policy action taken, and what was the effect of that? Because I think that's part of this chain, is being able to say when we have this data, 
is it used, how is it used, and what's the ultimate impact? So would love if you have further insights on that. Thank you. And I think we'll just take another question and then come back to the panel. So I think just in front of you, if she had a question. Hi. Hi, my name is Caitlin Love. I work on the international research team at Ipsos Public Affairs. Um, and I'm wondering for those of you that are running trainings and running programs, if you have assessed the impact of those, and if so, how are you doing it and kind of what the results were? Okay, who wants to go first? <laughs> One, Rima. Um, just to answer the question on data, um, there's a loop that makes it a virtual circle. And you may get data analyzed by data analysts, right? But the, the data has to be in the hands of those who are engaged in the ongoing advocacy on, a, on an ongoing <laughs> basis, right? And that's a really important loop, right? Um, so I'm not sure where, who generated the data and how widely it went out to groups like SEWA and others. Um, and I think that becomes really important in data because we have all the researchers and it goes into reports and it comes to the Center for Global Development. But really the people that are gonna use it are on the ground in the daily struggles. And it has to be packaged for them so that they can use it in an effective way. So the data source was from the government ministry of micro, small, and medium enterprises, and I spoke directly with the researchers who did it. I don't think they ever did a report on it. Um, so, and, and it's craziness because, and I think we also have to think about the implications, right? If, in fact, women are employing more people relative to size and industry sector and all of that, what does that mean for growth and ability to scale? So if men are better at mechanizing, for example, Right? Employing less people, but investing in an infrastructure to manufacture more faster, but with less people, but they can be more profitable. What does that mean? And so to what degree should we be thinking about hybrids with men and women working together? How do we employ more people that are also more productive because we use mechanization in a way that is good for the environment, good for society, and is transparent and good governance? And so I think there's a lot of conversations to be had, but the fact that no one knows the data, that it, the fact that the government's even collecting it, I think is amazing, but they are really not sharing it, um, but we need, every government to have a better understanding of the types of small businesses they have. We generally don't know a lot about what sectors they're in, employment rates. Um, you know, we, we know that 90% of them fail within the first five years. So being an entrepreneur is really hard. It's really risky. The gender aspects to this are significant if you're also responsible for caretaking and, and other things. Um, and you have limited assets to build a business on. And so there are Lots of important conversations, I think, that, that need to be had. But nonetheless, um, we, we need to see more women having the opportunity to move, if they want to, from the informal sector into the formal sector so that they do have the legal protections and that they do have the access to the tools and the markets they need to be successful. Our corporate members don't pay in cash, generally speaking. And, and nor does the federal government pay in cash in any country or local government. So we have to find a way to make these two groups um, and, and everything in between, that entire pipeline, work better, work better for people, work better for all of us. Can I do a two-hander? Because sure. we're, we're working on the data for India on businesses. And what we need to know, in addition to how many are owned by women and how many are owned by men, is how many are informal, where are they located? We know now that 75% of manufacturing units in India are informal. And 75% of those are home-based. So that means that 50% of all manufacturing units in India are home-based. We know that 80% of automobile parts are made in homes. So it's, it's not just, this is where we need to do both the gender analysis and the informal formal analysis. And I've been trying to get the dean of the business school at Harvard, who's Indian, to do a conference on <laughs> what does business look like in India? Because I say, you're talking about the, the cream of the crop. You're not talking about, and you have no idea what constrains the productivity 
of the informal units, right? They're, they're manufacturing in their homes, which are homes. They're not workplaces, right? And they have to stop production when the children come home and need a nap or the husband brings guests for tea. Um, you know, we really need to know the full picture of the enterprises. And we're, we've done the half revolution, which is on the labor force side, but now we're trying to look at the enterprise side to be able to say what percentage of units are what and where are they located and who owns them and how many workers and all of that. I was going to also say that the government isn't just waiting around for perfect data. We're working with the government of Karnataka in a couple of weeks. We have an event with over 3,000 women-owned businesses, um, government officials, corporations uh, from all industry sectors, qualified buyers that are all going to be coming together to do business and to figure out the way forward to get more money into the hands of women um, who can learn to earn that, that money. Um, but we want to teach all of those players about all these different aspects of being good on the environment, on social, on good governance and transparency and equal access and equal opportunity for everyone. So I think that we're seeing progress. Can I just say one thing? And I sure. think uh, it's one thing to have definitions and it's a very different world of reality. So I think if we want to match the two, I think we may have to have some another lifetime to match the two because when even for the informal sector women workers to reach a smaller or medium size yeah. enterprise it's still a far cry we're talking of a tiny or micro mm -hmm. enterprises and person. how are yeah. they going to reach to become a small or a medium enterprise mm -hmm. so i think all that data is irrelevant when it comes to the informal sector women workers especially both in the urban or in the rural areas. So I think um, even if we have a database, who uses it is another question. Yeah. So. Yeah. Or if people want to grow, yeah. it's another question. Yeah. Uh, so we'll go here. I think Maya had a question, and then uh, the lady over there in the blue sure, jacket. And it's not only a lifetime. We probably don't have more time, but this is such a wonderful panel. I have two questions, so you can answer whichever. A, a general question is, what has been the impact of mobile technology? on all these you know, local and global supply chains. And then for both Reem and Elizabeth, we have both of you here, and I would love the, the audience to hear a bit about the Gitanjali mm -hmm. cooperative and what you did with Accenture. Mm -hmm. so, um, we've, do, we've done a study on the mobile technology in three cities, one in Africa, one in Latin America, and one in um, Asia. Um, in Asia with, with Sewa. Um, people are using mobile technology, but not as much as you think, right? Um, and they, for the most part, do not have smartphones. So we all have to be really good at designing apps that they can use on the more simple phones. But they do use them, and they use them to know they don't want to pay to go to a supplier if the supplies aren't in. They don't want to go to get an order, and let, you know. So they use it a lot in their work to get knowledge of when the supplies are in, to take orders, to find out prices. And they use it in their organizing. Um, it's very important. Um, and we need apps that allow them to converse more. Um, but it's only beginning to pick up because a lot of them still do not have smartphones. Um, and a lot of them have tried online platforms and the greatest use has been with mobile banking. But we want to bring it into health and other areas. But we're still at, we're really at the beginning phase, I think, of this. Mm -hmm. And it's huge, and it's hugely important. Mm -hmm. And we have to give that power to those at the base of the pyramid. And yeah. then just before we go to Elizabeth and Rima, oh, um, the lady over there has, was raising her hand for a while. So I just wanted to get in another last question before we end. Speak up. Thank you. Uh, quick question. Uh, my name is Sabra Qureshi. I work as an independent consultant. And I also wanted to thank Dr. Martha Chen for ac raising the issue of gender and intersectionality, the critical, multidimensional whammies that women face. Um, uh, Rima had already, has already touched upon the question I was going to ask. One of the biggest challenges that we see facing women is the transition from micro enterprise to small and medium. Mm -hmm. And so much has been 
said and done about that. But I, I just wanted to find out if uh, there's been any research on what remained the most systemic. I know the doing business indicators talk all, all about that, but then the formal and informal comes in. So what really remains the most systemic issue to transition from um, micro to small and medium? Mm -hmm. And also, I just would like to ask, in your research, did you find significant differences that women entrepreneurs face at rural level versus urban? Because the cooperatives at collectives at the rural level are easier to form and organize than urban who urban women who face much more isolation. So I just wondered in your data if there's any significant mm -hmm. change there. Thank you. So um, can I just talk about the digital um, technology thing? And I think um, to answer your question as well, how do you use technology to scale up? And that's where I think technology plays a very major role. And unless and until women are organized and they use the technology the way they want to use. So we, where I was talking about the agriculture supply chain with the rural distribution network, we today have around 250,000 small farmers included in that. But we were able to do that only when we brought in the digital technology, the mobile technology, because we were grappling with the issues of procurement, the inventory management, with thousands and thousands of women going out into the villages and selling it, and then where do you procure, how much do you procure, which farmer has what kind of commodity, what volumes, and that's where we went to into using a digital uh, platform. We call it as our, it's our mobile based um, application where now each woman when she sells, she, and we also had to keep in mind that these are all illiterate or semi-literate women, so they can't keep sending messages. So how do you have either an icon-based or a voice-based technology? And as Marty Ben was saying, we don't have smartphones. So that was a challenge, but today we now have this app which is up and running. We had to go through three versions of it so that it was user friendly. And <laughs> likewise, we are doing it in our savings and credit program that how do you have real time transfer of money as well as data so that women do not lose their interest earnings by by the time a rural woman deposits her saving or um, you know her loan installment, and by the time it reaches the bank account, so that's where. And I think that we have been able to scale up using the mobile uh, application itself, because that uh, enabled us to you know increase our outreach in a much faster way as well. And going back to what Myra was talking about, the waste collectors and recyclers. We all know that these are the women who collect the waste, they segregate it, and then they were selling it to the, uh, you know, the scrap dealers, and they were earning a pittance. And uh, I think it was some eight or 10 years ago that Myra was convening a meeting at her World Bank um, office on you know how does the private sector enable and Elizabeth was there and we were there from Seva and we said that you know these are the women Sorry. collecting waste who are uh, willing to recycle and convert it into recycled paper so which private sector is willing to partner with us so that you know with these waste recyclers uh, recyclers could be brought into the mainstream and that's where Elizabeth and We Connect came in. They, we had Accenture, which helped us work out the entire assembly line and the supply chain. So today, we started with a small group of 50 women some five years ago. Accenture helped us, and today we have 500 women mm -hmm. who are all, instead of you know moving around and roaming on the streets from 3 a.m. in the morning till afternoon, now sit in a nice little place. They recycle, uh, convert the recycled paper into stationery. And I'm very happy we are, we've just signed a vendor's agreement with Walmart, and we have already been supplying to Staples. And I think that's where it helped us scale up. And mm -hmm. so now women are not seen as, you know, in India they were seen as people who would be seen as thieves coming in the dark and uh, or you know they were really looked down upon as the 
lowest in the economic strata, but now have dignified work. Mm -hmm. You know, she no longer has to start her day at 3 a.m. rummaging the garbage heaps mm -hmm. or, you know, um, but she sits in this nice little place and she makes stationery and it goes. And the women earn anywhere between eight to 10,000 rupees a month where she was only earning, you know, maybe 500 or 600 rupees collecting the waste, segregating it and selling it to a scrap dealer. So I think thanks to Myra for organizing that <laughs> conference and then we connect bringing Accenture and then Staples and Walmarts to us. Um, I love all the cross collaboration on this panel as <laughs> <Yeah>. well. <laughs> so I'm telling Myra panel. that she should That's now awesome. do a very good analytical documentation. One good thing World Bank did and how it transformed. <laughs> directly working with the civil society and how it transforms the lives while spending millions and millions of dollars giving into the governments, you know, and we don't know how many lives get transformed. And that's where, you know, the new age economy and the new age financing instruments have to be brought out. And that's what I think we want Myra to bring out. So I think we're at the end of the end. <laughs> End of time, I guess. Uh, so, uh, Marty, you have the last um, comment. I think well, the question was to you. So, if you want to, I'll remind me. Which one? <laughs> what was the question? Yeah. <laughs> what's the obstacle for? Oh, for the pr the scaling up. I thought you pointed to somebody here, and I was saying, okay, the scaling up. What what we know is this: it's reducing the negatives. If you're a home-based worker, it's very hard to scale up if you don't have housing tenure and basic infrastructure services. If you're a street vendor and there's a threat of uh, confiscation, of uh, being forced to move on, you are not going to increase your stock. You're not going to improve your equipment. So there's a lot in the regulatory environment that keeps them. The public sector has a major role. The private sector cannot do it all, right? Um, if you're a waste picker and you don't have a shed, to sort and uh, then to store and then to bundle and compact your waste um, and it's on the top of your tin roof, you're not as productive as the waste picker co-op that has a shed. So that's another whole area of procurement, government procurement is around waste, right? And it's happening I've, in Buenos Aires, in Colombia, in, uh, in Pune, in India, um, Bangalore. So we have to see what is keeping them down, right? And it's not just access to markets. It's this fact that they're working in private homes in the settlements, informal settlements, and in public space, or in natural resources. And all of those are being privatized, being used for other purposes, and the majority of the workforce is being swept away to the periphery of cities, right? As long as we're doing that, how can they raise their productivity, right? So I think we have to look at those regulatory barriers. It's not just all supply side interventions mm -hmm. that'll make the difference for the informal workforce. Mm -hmm. so. I think Elizabeth would like the last word, so. Um. <laughs> just quickly, I think the one thing that we've noticed in our work is that if, if workers don't have the skills that employers need, they're not going to hire them. If suppliers don't have the products and services that the buyers want, they're not going to buy from them. It's really, we have to invest in the skills of the people to offer value that people will pay for. And so I, I just think it's really critical that we, we yes, there are these ecosystem and, and the environments in which people are trying to work, um, but I think at the same time, we have to just make sure that people are skilled so, so that the resources that are out there, um, they will have access to. Mm -hmm. On that note, it seems like you all are doing a good job of meeting demand and supply with your, your organizations and resources. And um, on that note of cross-collaboration, I'm also very curious to see what happens with the initiative that you've talked about. Um, and then also uh, today, the rest of the day, we have um, deeper dives into savings and building assets and all of that. So I hope that we can gain a lot from those conversations as well. So thank you, everyone, for a wonderful panel. Can um, we close with a song? <laughs> Surely, my yeah. want to read a song. Yeah, because
we always believe that it's the women who will overcome on their own someday. So I'll sing in Gujarati, but maybe some of you may know it's we shall overcome in English, but it's Ame par karishu, Ame par karishu, Ame par karishu ek day, oh unantar ma, Ame te vishwas, Ame par karishu ek din. Is this on? All right. Thank you again to our panelists and our moderator. I think that is the first time at CGD we've ever ended a panel in song. I could be wrong. So that was incredible. Um, please be back in your seats at 1.30. Enjoy lunch, which is out those doors behind you. OK, we're going to get started again. Hi, everyone. I'm Megan O'Donnell. I coordinate the Gender and Development Program here at CGD. Very happy to have you all with us. I have the pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker for this afternoon. Uh, professor Dean Carlin is a professor of economics at Yale University. And he's also the president and founder of Innovations for Poverty Action, or as many of you likely know it as, IPA. His research focuses on microeconomic issues of public policies and poverty. Much of his work uses behavioral economics approaches to examine economic and policy issues relevant to developing countries, with particular attention to policies to increase the incomes and well being of women and men in extreme poverty. Dean received his PhD in economics from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and his MBA and MPP from the University of Chicago. We're very excited to have him here with us, uh, first to give the keynote and then to participate in our next panel. Please join me in welcoming him. Great. Hi, everybody. Um, so I, I feel like I'm in a social experiment. I'm not accustomed to being the underrepresented minority in a, in a speaking panel. This is great. Um, so I am I'm aiming here to finish in maybe 20 rather than 30 so that um, there can be some, some Q&A um, and, and discussion. Two basic themes to what I want to talk about. Um, my feeble attempt at alliteration, moving and measuring gender equality. Um, they're obviously related. I'm going to um, first, uh, so a lot, I think a lot more of the talk is actually going to be focusing on the measurement, but there, I want to start off with some, some, some points and some observations about the moving part. Um, and first, just to say that I'm a, you know, I'm not a, um, when people describe my research portfolio, they do not describe me as a researcher who focuses on gender issues. Having said that, it, in a lot of the things we study, Gender equality and gender and female decision-making power is an outcome of high interest in lots of, for lots of reasons. Um, and so I'm someone who has been a consumer and mild producer, but not, you know, I, not, so it's kind of, it was fun for me to, for what it's worth to put this together and think through this because, frankly, I've put together lots of talks on other topics and I unfortunately was not able to just grab one off the shelf and say, here you go. Um, and that's actually a nice opportunity for um, to be able to take that step back and think about wh where are we. And the striking thing is, from what I see as from an outsider on it, is that there's a lot of things that have gotten a lot of hype, and unfortunately have not lived up to the hype. Microcredit, which got a lot of hype for lots of outcomes, one of the most striking things to me that happened in the evolution of the microcredit kind of rhetoric and debate and dialogue was when the first randomized trials started coming out showing that no, average income was not increasing, average consumption was not increasing, some good things were happening, but not kind of the hope for lifting people up out of poverty story. Um, almost the immediate reaction I would hear from some practitioners was, oh, no, 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 it was always about female power. And, and my first reaction was, well, first of all, no, it wasn't. <laughs> like, I can show you your rhetoric. <laughs> And yes, that's one of the things that you talked about, but that was, you know, very rarely was it like the thing that you're doing. So you're a little bit of moving the goalpost there. But the other striking thing is that a lot of the studies that measured the impact of microcredit also did look at female decision-making power. 
And, and, and there's only one of the studies that measured it and actually found a change. And it was the one that most people hate the most, because it was comportamos. We're not, on, we're not being recorded here on the internet, are we? I don't want to say hate the most in that way. But you know, they charge 100% interest rates. It was a for-profit company. Um, started as a nonprofit, converted to a for-profit. You know, Muhammad Yunus has been very publicly critical of their, of their policies and interest rates. Um, but yet, they were the only ones that actually did something in the group meeting process of microcredit where, and I wouldn't describe what they did. Like, I think anybody who had was, per, was part of, of, a, of, of a program which explicitly was going forward and trying to promote a shift in social norms. This would not rise up to that level of depthness of, of the curriculum, but there were some aspects of their group meetings where they were talking with the women who were in the meetings about how they go about making decisions, um, what types of, what's the domain over which they, they, they make decisions, things of this nature, and that was actually part of their kind of steps that they would walk through when they weren't talking just about repaying loans. And it was the only one that found an impact on that. And so it did, you know, I, I do think that's an area that is worthy of further replication to the extent that there are groups out there that are forming groups of women to do something that is not about decision making power. The question is, should things be added to that that explicitly talk about it? And that, you know, that one result is, is in dire need of some replication to see if that's, that's real. Community driven development is another area that I've often heard presented and talked about as uh, an effort to empower women. And the, um, you know, one of the, the biggest randomized trials studied on this one and others are finding the same, do not find those effects. Um, and you know, so you know, again, there's kind of a bit of overhype. It doesn't mean there aren't things out there that might work, but let's, let's not get too excited by what we hope works and let's go find out what's actually moving the needle. So what has? Well, here's some things that have. And some of these, you'll notice, are not really gender interventions per se. So the first, um, and, I, and I, I break this down a little bit by using, by the types of outcomes that are looked at, using kind of traditional measures of decision making power. And I'm putting traditional in quotes, just because I think it's kind of one of the, and I'm gonna talk about measurement in a moment in, more, more, in a more complete way. But by traditional I hear, I mean questions that basically say, um, who makes the following decisions? You, your husband, together, if there's conflict, who wins, et cetera. Things, questions that are somewhat of that structure. So one set of studies that we found moved the needle, these had nothing to do with gender from the way they were done. They were just a, it was called the graduation program. I actually presented them here on this stage about two years ago. Um, it's a multifaceted program working with the ultra poor. It's a grant program, requires a subsidy, costs about $1,000 a household provides four goats or beekeeping or guinea pigs, provides training, provides life coaching, provides access to savings, help. It's a very much modeled after the idea that the problem with being poor is not any one thing. You have to solve multiple constraints to help people escape a poverty trap. And we are finding in three years and even seven years that the results sustain themselves well after the program ceases to um, engage with the household. So that's great on the economic outcomes. On the, on the female power households using those questions, we do find on, at two year mark even though there was nothing whatsoever done explicitly to address female decision-making power within the household, we do find that the woman has reports making um, more of the decisions that were asked about, uh, how, about health and education and expenditures and business investment. We find that at the two-year result, a statistically significant result, about a 0.1, if I remember correctly, 0 0.1, 0 0.15 standard deviation move. At the three-year, we get into a little bit what's technically called statistical never ever land. The, the point estimate is half of the second year result. It is not statistically different from zero, but it's also not statistically different from the positive second year result. So I cannot, if I just, if all we had was the three year result, one would report that as a null result. You know, it's just not different from zero. But the fact that we also cannot reject that it's different from the two year puts us in this kind of world of, this is interesting, if we ignore the standard errors, we would say, well, the result dissipated. Why might the result dissipate? Well, social norms are hard to move. Maybe it was a short run effect and it just needs more work to sustain. Maybe the man grabbed back the power, um, which basically goes to show how resilient social norms can be and shifting equilibrium is not necessarily an easy thing to do. And you can go and you can get people to do things a little bit differently for a month or two or even six months to a year 
but you're fighting strong forces that are deeply embedded in the culture uh, and of a society, and you want to shift those, it needs to be a little bit more than some non-gender intervention that just empowers women by giving them economic opportunity. Um, it also could just be a weak effect, and maybe the right answer is kind of halfway between the two, and so one draw was positive and one was in the middle. How are we gonna find out the difference between that? Replication, do more, understand more, see what's happening. And also I think this would be very beneficial to see that study intersected with something that actually explicitly tried to improve the women's power within the household. Try to do one uh, kind of a norm shifting intervention alongside that. Maybe that would make the difference between two years being there and three years going away and two years being there and sustaining. And maybe it's because there was an actual engagement on that issue that it did not sustain itself. That's a hypothesis. Um, another example where we saw movement where, again, the intervention had nothing to do with gender was on commitment savings. Um, we rolled out a commitment savings product in the Philippines. The um, original paper was called Tying Odysseus to the Mask because it was about self-control. We used the myth story of, of Odysseus to kind of make the point about commitment savings being a good way to help people tie up their savings away from themselves so that they don't succumb to temptation. Well, it turns out when we did a longer term follow-up, a year, um, so it wasn't really long, but a, a, long, a one year follow-up, we also found that some of the women, had, the women specifically who had less decision-making power in the beginning, ended up with more power in the household over decisions and more dur household durable goods purchased. So we originally had this paper written and titled Tying Husbands to the Mask. Um, we, we ended up changing the title, unfortunately. <laughs> So I get to make the joke when I talk, but I, you know, the paper's called Female Empowerment, blah, blah, blah. Um, so, um, but again, I wanna reinforce the point here. This was not a gender intervention. It was not designed that way. It was not motivated that way. Um, yes, as we're thinking about the paths of impact, we thought about this issue, and that's why we measured it. But it was not that, you know, from the onset, this was designed and there was nothing built into the intervention that was about um, gender. And so that, that's, I think, an important lesson to remember is that even though gender equality is an important outcome that we're concerned with, that doesn't necessarily mean that all paths to get there lead through, um, lead through things that aren't necessarily gender focused. But that doesn't mean that you could always get it without that. So you have to know what's doing it and what's not. Um, using attitudes um, as, as measures, we have seen this on political quotas um, in India where the, and here, here's an important difference between that and community driven development if you want to think about why one might work and the other not. The political quota is actually giving the women power. Community driven development is kind of building a process in that you hope through engagement you end up with women having more power. Those are very different things. <laughs> so what the lesson from that is that if you actually give the woman the power that yes, attitudes in the community shifted. Um, the other way to think about it is not even looking at decision-making power and just saying, well, wait a second, some of the issues about gender equality, let's not look at decision-making power, let's just look at outcomes. Let's look at employment, let's look at education, and let's just see, are we moving the needle on equality as measured in this way? Um, and this is where you see some striking changes. So there's a, a paper by Rob Jensen on creating good jobs for young women um, in BPOs. Um, drawing a blank on what BPO stands for, but like call centers, but it's not a call center. Anybody know what BPO stands for? Business profits is what? Outsourcing, thank you. Um, the point is these are good jobs. And, and, and the study found if you create these BPO opportunities, that with a 10-year horizon, families were investing more in their girls, for edu their education of their girls, given that these jobs were opening up in their communities. Right? And, and that's not, again, there's nothing gender about this. It was just creating good jobs that were available to women. And then you see households educating their 10-year-olds better um, because they're looking down the horizon and seeing that look at these great opportunities, but we have to plan for that. Um, similar results in Bangladesh. The growth in jobs leads to higher investment in girls and reducing child marriage. Same, same basic idea. So here's you know, answers were just looking at increasing opportunities, increasing better, improving labor markets can have, um, that people are forward thinking and, and these, these changes that happen in society are important and can shift the way investments are made. Um, the, um, and then the, the, I'm sorry, the other ac economic outcomes refers back to the commitment savings because we actually do look there both at 
the decisions that are made by asking kind of the standard questions about who makes the decision, but we also then looked at the actual durable goods that are purchased and just looked and seen. What, what, were they more likely to buy a moped or a refrigerator? And they were more likely to buy household durables after getting the commitment savings account than the control group that did not. Um, okay, measurement. So measurement, first of all, I, as, an out, as a bit of an outsider, as a user of this, so I produce some, I would say that we need a lot more work on this. There's definitely some challenging areas. I'm breaking them off into four buckets, as I see, as the, the, the kinds of things that people use to, to think about these. The first is just looking at final outcomes. So I referred to a couple of these earlier. Look at, let's look at employment, look, look at human capital. That's ultimately what we mean when we say gender equality. We mean um, equal opportunity to these economic opportunities and political opportunities. And so that's actually just measurable as an outcome and let's see how men are doing versus women. Um, violence also fits into that, into that metric. And you know, the upside of using this is that ultimately this is what matters. This is, this is what we talk, this is what we mean when we say gender equality. The downside is, if you use this as the measure, yes, it tells you whether you got to the end goal, but it doesn't tell you the reasons for how you got there. And so if you want to, um, it's a good way of looking backwards to say, waha, you know, ooh-la-la, -la, we, we got where we wanted to be, or we got towards where we want to be. But it's not a great way to learn how and why you got there. Um, so you do need some process changes, I think, to understand how and why you got there so that when you go to some other country and you're thinking about what the policy should be there, um, you, you can, you can um, better understand whether the lessons from one place will transfer over. Um, violence has its own challenges. I have a study in the Philippines, um, and just like the others, where, I, where we were very, where we were thinking about gender issues, it was not a gender intervention. It was a, similar to the ultra-poor graduation that I mentioned earlier, um, but a much cheaper model without, um, without all of the productive assets, but it still had a lot of the other features to it. It also had an evangelical Christian aspect to it where the group was preaching and they agreed to randomize whether they were preaching or not and we wanted to see how the inclusion and in, you know the deeper inclusion in, in church influenced various socioeconomic and cycle and social cycle outcomes social <laughs> that thank you thank you we found a lot of increases in religion some increases in some other things but it's only six months not too much we also found an increase in, and we did this using an approach called list randomization, which is a way of eliciting sensitive questions. So what list randomization does is you, you ask half of your sample frame, it doesn't have to be exactly half, but a ran, it has to be you know, a random subset, three innocuous questions. And you say, don't tell me yes or no to these questions, just count the number of yeses. Do you own a bicycle? Do you live in the same village you were born in? And do you have any family living in Manila? Um, and so they just tell us zero, one, two, or three. Totally innocuous questions. The other half get those same three innocuous questions plus somebody, um, some, at least one female in my house has been physically abused in the past year, okay? And the point is, and again, you just say, give me the count. And so if you get a total of 3.2 for that second group and 2.9 for the first group, then you know that 30% of your sample frame is saying, yes, there has been someone physically abused in the household in the past year, okay? And it's a good way of eliciting a question where they might not want to reveal to you face to face, yes to that, okay? And then you can compare treatment and control doing that same split in your treatment group to control group. So we actually find the, the physical violence reporting went up from this program. Now, that can have two very different interpretations, and this is the challenge measurement-wise. On one hand, that could be an increase in reporting, a, no change in underlying violence, it's just an increase in their their recognition, at one of two levels, their recognition that what happened to me is violence, or it could be um, a more of a willingness to actually admit it, even though we're doing it in a way that's hidden, they still might hide it, and, but yet maybe as a byproduct of this program, they were more willing to share it. You know, we found that with, I found with um, some, uh, this one, one project with health, um, health intervention trying to teach about health hygiene to avoid diarrhea increased the reporti reportage of diarrhea. Same basic issue. I don't think what happened was that diarrhea went up. I think that before they just thought that that was normal. And now they realize that's diarrhea. Um, so it's the same basic issue. How do, you, how do you get under that? That's an area that I'm not claiming to be an expert on. There, the one piece of evidence that we had that suggested this might actually be a bad outcome was that we, we also do have the standard questions about household decision making and when there's conflict and what are the types of things that are conflict over. And we do see an increase in reporting about conflict about 
relationships with in-laws and, um, and household decision making. And we see an increase in the reporting of, of conflict over some issues there. But it's not a very strong result statistically. So this is, this is an issue that we see from this result as um, you know, enough to dig in on when we go back and do another wave of data so that we can try to understand it more. We didn't, we didn't kind of expect this result, right? So it was just one question on a survey, and so you get, you know, that's... Okay, um, so that's looking at final outcomes. Um, staged outcomes. So stage, by staged outcome, what I mean, and I'm just gonna give you a very specific example from Casey et al. Um, they ran a structured community activity. It was basically a thank you present for the process. But as part of the thank you present, we do this a lot of times as field researchers where you, you're giving out money for some reason, but you figure why, rather than just give out the money, why don't we actually use that as a way of measuring something? And so they gave out the money as a thank you present to the community and told the community, you know, you get to do something with it. Well, that becomes a measurement. What are they gonna do with it? And then you can observe what they do with it and how your treatment influences what they do with it. And likewise, in this case, they can, they can actually take a person who observes the community meeting in which they're deciding what to do, and they can just sit there and count how many times does a woman speak in this meeting. And that becomes a measure of, of the strength of the voice of women and their willingness to speak up. Right? So it's a structured way of observing real behavior rather than these kind of general statements of attitudes and participation and decisions that can be very subjective and tough. And it's a way of actually trying to create things to actually observe that people are doing. So this is you know, a huge upside to it. Of course, they're structured and staged. And, um, but, um, and, and depending on what it is, might be important or trivial, but it's still real. And that's actually, I think, an important difference in those types of measures when one can think creatively about that. Um, um, a third are attitudes and games. So this is similar, but um, games where husband and wife are asked to, for instance, um, play a little game with money, and you get to see how willing uh, are the two to share resources or, or keep their own and things of this nature, and you can construct things that are of that nature that have been used in many cases. And the last is the decision-making power. And this is actually the most common, but I think this is an area where you know, these are problematic, and some of the other methods are, um, when viable, potentially, potentially better, but we certainly need more work on these. Two different dimensions over which I want to highlight, one of which I have some data to actually show you that come from Erica Field and Rachel Glenister's um, work in Bangladesh. Um, and the other is just a thought exercise. So the, what I'll share you with in a moment is specificity versus broad. Do you in general make decisions, are you, who makes decisions about healthcare versus who makes decisions about buying medicine? And you can get some really different answers depending on that. And that's a problem. I don't know which is right, right? I tend to think the specific is probably right, but you could easily imagine a world in which the specific misses the target, and also the specific makes it hard to compare across cultures and economic and health settings because the specific might need to be very different from one place to another, whereas the broad might be something that you can just tr translate from one language to another and have the same question and compare across places. So there's genuine trade-offs there in how to deal with it. The second one, since I don't have any data I'm gonna talk about first, which is who makes the decision versus whether decision is made is close to your personal opinion, your desire. So here's the point. A lot of the way these questions are asked is, who makes the decision on um, whether to buy large household durables? And then, and then sometimes it's oh, man, woman, both, in-laws. Um, if there is disagreement, whose decision ultimately carries you know, forward? Things like this. The problem is, Imagine a world in which you ask that question and the woman gets half the decisions and the man gets half the decisions. And you go, great, well, woman has half the power. Imagine a slightly different world. Imagine a world in which the man gets to decide who gets to make each decision. Okay? And the man knows when his wife agrees with him and when not. So he gives her all the things to decide that line up exactly with what he wants and he takes all the ones where they disagree. And there you go. So now he has 100% of the power by any reasonable definition of power. But you get this question and it's told 50-50. So now how do you ask this other question? That's not easy. Asking hypothetical questions, it's like saying to you, okay, take the decisions that were made in this past year on buying household durables. How far from your optimal were they? You try that in the field, good luck, <laughs> right? Um, imagine, you know, my favorite one example of that is on the, on the choosing how many children to have. Imagine your husband were not here. How many children would you like to have? 
right? Because that's basically what you want to ask. So, so you can see how this is not, I don't have an answer on this. I have a problem. But you know, some, we need, that's why we tend to focus on when there's conflict and on the perverted hope that even if they disagree and he has the power, she has the power, that there's still some discussion and you kind of get what you need out of it by just observing whether there's conflict. But that doesn't actually tell you, who, you know, what you actually want to know. So here's the specific versus um, general that comes from um, 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 Field and Glenister's work. So you know, here you have the standard phrasing. By standard, I just mean the general, because that is the more common way that these are done. Who usually makes decisions about healthcare? Can you guys see over the chairs or no? So a woman has 12.6% and the spouse has 56.2. Then you ask, who can make the decision if the child is sick and needs immediate care? It's the exact opposite. Now the woman has 58% and the man 10. Who usually purchases medicine? Now she doesn't, now he does. Can the woman buy medicine by herself? 71%, yes. But back in the senior phrasing, you know, she wasn't making the decision. These are, you know, these are, this is all over the place. Um, so, and again, the challenge here is specific. We tend to think in that context is likely better, but then if, if those specific questions are not the appropriate questions to capture the relevant decisions across, that might not be good. Now, in these cases, I think though most people would agree that those are probably questions that might apply everywhere. And so maybe it's all good and well with these. But you can at least imagine some other context in which the specific question is necessarily context specific and you can't just translate and run. Um, similarly, these just show the pairwise correlations between those same four questions on the, on the columns and, a, and some other questions on more like attitudes and things like this. Does not believe boys should be fed first. Does not think husbands should be more educated than wives. And the striking thing here is how small the correlation is between all of these. Um, right? so, um, and, uh, and so the, you know, they are all at least correctly signed. <laughs> we'll give them that. But that's about it. These are pretty small correlations between these very specific decision making power and these more general attitudinal questions. Um, so they're picking up either something very different. They might both be important, but the fact that they're not correlated much at all is striking. Did I finish in 20? Did I, did I do my job? Um, Thank you. Hi. I am still wrestling with your, I think it was your first slide, about um, your, where you're focusing on those interventions that you see were gender specific, that didn't have the uh, strong outcomes, and those that were not gender focused, but you were, they delivered results. And uh, my question is, in order, as you said, to be able to capture that, right, the outcomes, even, on, even where the projects were, or the interventions were not gender focused, you nevertheless had to have designed some mechanisms, et cetera, by which you were going to be able to capture and track that information. And I wonder whether simply by, not simply because I think that's actually huge, that process in and of itself, whereby you identified and understood the population with which you were dealing with as distinct categories based on male or woman, whether that in and of itself meant that you could have integrated, uh, whether you or whoever integrated uh, criteria and uh, factors that could have contributed to that those sort of uh, positive outcomes with respect to uh, progress on the uh, indicators towards gender equality. Do you understand? No. Okay. Uh, <laughs> do, you, do you mean that because we went through the thinking on how to measure this, that the, the program itself could have included a gender component? Uh, yes, I, I do some work on trade and gender. And one of the things we do in looking at, you know, for instance, uh, trade policy and how do you how do you conduct trade negotiations in a way that lead to uh, outcomes that capture the fact that you're dealing with different, you're dealing with men and women as distinct categories, that just that realization in and of itself helps you to incorporate uh, whether it's uh, you know, the questions, whether it's your, your selection of, 
the audience with which you're working, etc., that that in and of itself can actually be a very, is a key uh, factor in almost in some ways a, um, a preliminary, what's the word I'm looking for, a requirement, a prerequisite, thank you, for being able to effectively conduct, um, integrate gender uh, perspective and analysis into the formulation of trade policy, for instance. And so I'm wondering whether that might help to account for some of your results there. Um, yeah, I don't think it really changed the, um, I, yeah, I, I add a mass. I just don't think it, um, you know, the sample frame is the sample frame of the household. So it wasn't changing the sample frame. Um, and um, it simply just wasn't a part of what the programs were, like with the exception of the Comportamos thing where there was this, but even that, it was never described to us as a gender thing. We actually went back to them at some point after we saw the results and said, um, to get the details of what do you actually do in these meetings? And they gave us the list and we saw a few things that weren't, that like I said, were had a little bit to do with um, uh, helping people think through decisions and, and be proactive about um, increasing their voice. And it is a program that targets women, only women. Um, by design, but it wasn't um, that, you know, the other the other programs. I, I really don't think that. If I understand your question correctly, it's like does the act of measuring and thinking through measurement change the program? And I don't think I don't I really don't think they did, because it, it also because it was really just one little module in a very long survey, it's a two hour survey, and it's a ten minute component of it. So it's not that the it, you know no one no one took that survey or looked at that survey and said ah that's a gender survey. It's just a 10 minute component asking questions about who makes decisions. One and a fifth, yeah. Ashwarya? I wanted to ask if you could say a little bit about um, your work on microenterprise and sort of productivity. There's been some sort of a battle sometimes in talking about women and men owned microenterprises and how well they do. Um, in light of your ultra poor graduation results, in terms of productivity of small enterprises, it doesn't matter if it's livestock versus not. So I think this is, a, there's some results that we find very um, puzzling that are out there that I think are important to dig in on. One of the most, um, it's, it, there's one in particular and then it, the, there's been some similar results. So it's by a paper by Demel McKenzie and Woodruff in Sri Lanka. And in this paper, they, gave out cash grants. So it was basically saying, okay, let's try to dig in a, what's happening inside the box behind some of these microcredit results that are a little bit puzzling. So, but let's do it in a way that doesn't have any selection issues whatsoever um, where um, people might be not choosing to borrow because they're afraid of the loan and things like that. Let's just actually get back to a fundamental parameter. What's the return to capital? Right, as a first order question. This is a very important parameter to have your head around. So the, way to, the best way to do that is not a loan because some people will choose to borrow and some not for reasons that might be correlated with returns to capital. So let's just give out money. So very simple. So it went up to households, I mean to microenterprise and gave them capital. And within the enterprise found that men had these, overall the average return was pretty high around 45, 55%. But it turns out it was all in the men, the women, Businesses, the investments, some investments were made, but a year or two late, years later, the businesses were not doing any better. It was a very striking result. Now, why is that was was left as more mystery? I mean, there was a lot done to dig in, and in you know the way you dig in empirically on that is you come up with other hypotheses and you and you add them to your kind of econometric model and you see whether you can kind of beat away the gender result. So let's say it's about education, and it turns out men are more educated than women and you have to have education to do well in this enterprise. And so then that means that once you look at the effect on high educated versus low educated, you see the gender result disappear. Nothing beat away the gender result though, so it stayed. And it was you know, left with some sense that basically it's an indication that the women's businesses are a bit more um, complicated and integrated in with the household and so some of the cash flows are not getting, that, that's one kind of hypothesis that I think is valid that they, some of the cash flows were not getting fully accounted for because the enterprises are more integrated with the household where the men's house enterprises are a bit more separated. So that could explain it. But this is a big, you know, this is I think an important area and we have seen some work try to follow on with that. 
um, because there is so much effort to, um, to address gender equality issues by increasing economic opportunity through microenterprise. The, 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 the points made earlier about labor markets, I think, to me, I see as the, the strongest evidence we have for what to do um, on, in terms of just changing economic opportunities. And to the, you know, the fact that we see introduction of formal sector wages, um, formal sector job opportunities, increasing female education, is to, as far as I was concerned, if I was not a researcher and I was just a doer and I had to choose something to do, that's what's currently, I think, has the strongest evidence out there. The microenterprise development stuff has not been really showing that. The graduation program was a much more integrated than just mere microenterprise development, so that's why I'm counting that as a bit differently. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I'm Louise Fox, and I did a paper on measuring subjective economic empowerment, and I think we need to be careful about what we say is the final outcome, and also there is a, a certain amount of circularity. So if you were a developmental psychologist, empowerment, power and agency, would be for you a final outcome. For you as an economist, you put up earnings, this is what we care about. Um, now I think it is an interesting question what psychological development and education and skills and whatever have to do with that variable, including the example you cited from Sri Lanka. Uh, but um, we shouldn't maybe, is it right, to, I'm asking a question, is it right to consider it only as a process uh, variable on our way somewhere else? Because it's what you showed earlier is that it's actually possible to get somewhere else without having that process at all. Uh, I, I, I hear your point. Um, um, there, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna wiggle a little on the, and, and make the point that the violence point, I think is, you know, one could think of emotional violence as well and social violence in a sense, that's a thing, rather than physical violence. And I, I see that as capturing, but I, I, I think if I give this talk again, I should expand the word violence. I, I do see your point that, that there could be just this kind of social oppression that is a final outcome that one cares about. Um, and that is the that is the spirit of what I was thinking about when I wrote when I added violence was that there are some outcomes that are just just wrong in their own right, and we want to beat those down. No pun intended. Um, um, and so, but yeah, I hear what you're saying. Yeah, I'm getting a. Hi, I'm Patty Pettish, and I'm a qualitative field researcher currently working on gender norms in the agricultural sector with the CGIAR. And my qu I, I mentioned this earlier, I think it would be really valuable to think about decisions not only in terms of the daily household budget decisions, but the larger kind of strategic life choice decisions. And the extent to which women, I mean you kind of got at this with the number of children question. Um, but in a facetious <laughs> way, that's a very serious issue for a woman. Um, also, just whether and where she can work and how much autonomy mm -hmm. she has. Right. No. That, and that has. is usually part of, I mean, these decision making, the standard ones will often include, you know, um, who makes decisions over what, what occupation you can have and work and who makes decisions over, over agriculture. These are not daily decisions. This right. is like, oh, and children. Um, but, oh, whether in-laws can live with you or not, things like this. Right, um, but where I want to push you further is a woman's decision set is often very different from a man's, um, especially if you're in the rural area. And I am currently running a study in 137 villages, and we asked the same question everywhere about how are decisions made about a woman's crop and the part of the crop that will be sold and the part of the crop that will be kept back and who will do the selling. Um, and we have kind of mostly it's joint, but then 20% it's the man's decision, 20% it's the woman's decision. But in the joint, when they talk about the joint process, it's just what you said. If the man agrees with the woman, things are great, but he would always have the final say, right. even in that joint space, if you probe a bit further on the discussion. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of norms around agency and they're deeply contextual. 
And I think we need to start working harder in understanding how they play out in specific contexts and designing interventions for both men and, and women that um, it's not good enough in my view anymore that this happens, you know, creating jobs in the formal sector also happens, can be very good for women. I think we see a lot of gender segregation in the formal sector. There's a lot of norms around the kinds of jobs women can do. It's, ti it's time to move past, I think, superficial experiments um, on gender, I guess. But I, I was with you until the last sentence. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, the, the last sentence does not follow from everything else you said. I mean, you, all of those are exactly the types of issues that I completely agree with about how to measure these things are really important. But we still want to then know when there's a program that's aiming to move these things, does it work or not? And that's an experiment helps you understand whether something has changed in the world as a consequence of a policy. And that has nothing to do with how you measure things. You can have qualitative experiments up the wazoo. These are not, so everything you said, I completely agree with, but the last sentence does not follow from everything else. Okay. I said, okay, I just get to stay. All right, I'm so glad that there's so much interest in the topic. Tomorrow morning, the entire focus will be on what we measure and what works and does it have to be gender specific or not. So come back tomorrow if all of these issues are of interest. For now, I'm going to turn it over to our next moderator, Karen Miller from Women's World Banking, who will introduce our panel on financial inclusion. Great, thank you so much. Uh, that was a fascinating discussion, Dean, and you'll be chiming in much more as we uh, continue this panel. I was very pleased to actually see the name of this uh, panel, which was Women as Consumers. And I think that is so critical to the work that we do at Women's World Banking is that we absolutely think that women are consumers of financial products. They need the access to the appropriate financial products and services. And uh, the work that we do around the world is focus on bridging that gap between the women's needs um, and the different uh, organizations that can provide those products and services. And so I know we're in the post-lunch slump, but I have no doubt that our panelists are going to keep us very engaged uh, this afternoon. And so I'm looking forward to a very uh, interactive discussion. I am apologizing in advance that I have my phone here. It's not to be checking uh, my Twitter feed or anything like that. It's just monitoring the time and making sure that uh, we keep to a schedule here. So. If I pick it up, don't be offended. Um, so why don't we go ahead and uh, jump right in. I want to actually start by getting an understanding of the landscape, and particularly from a data perspective, of women and their access to financial products and services. And I thought that Rosita from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation could start us off by explaining a little bit about the data that they've seen and what that means for uh, women and their access to products and services. Absolutely. And thank you to CGD for putting this day together. I'm really excited about the opportunity of learning. So the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation believes that all lives have equal value. Um, and the financial services for the poor team believes that an economy that includes everyone will benefit everyone. But those of us who work in financial services for the poor know that of the two billion 
that remain um, excluded from the formal financial system, 1.1 billion of them are women. Um, from the data we've learned, frankly, it's expensive to be poor, especially if you're a woman. But what we've noticed is an opportunity, and this is where we have a little bit of hope, in that um, there is a digital solution. And that digital solution helps to overcome some of the barriers that are shared by both women and men, but have particular nuances and particular difficulties to overcome as it relates to women. And those are ways as it relates to the digital, digital um, exhaust of data that digital can produce, uh, which fills in some of the data gaps about identity. Um, it's also about barriers around time poverty that are unique to women, um, as well as the ability to overcome barriers around distance and just costs overall. So you'll notice that some of these barriers are shared by men, but they have a particularly catalytic opportunity when they're removed for women. And what we've learned um, from qualitative and quantitative research is that fundamentally women get, store, spend, invest, borrow, protect, and manage their money differently. And what we saw with microfinance was whether it's a financial, independent of what type of financial service provider it was, is there was just this a sense that you could kind of take a lot of the products and services that were provided for the middle or the top of the pyramid throw the word micro in front of it <laughs> and push it down. And then early on with some of the efforts around gender, we realized it wasn't enough to just give it a feminine name or to color it pink or red. Um, but really, you just have to understand what is it about those ways that women do things differently and how they make their decisions. Um, so there's a lot of things we know and a lot of things that we don't know um, about the woman's customer journey. And I would love to share um, just a few data points about three things that we do know so if we could pull up this slide, um, this is some data that's available if you'd like to dig in a little bit more. There's an organization called Intermedia, which every year keeps us on track and does an analysis of demand side data in the eight countries that we focus on. And in Africa, those uh, countries are Tanzania, Uganda, Kenya, and Nigeria. In South Asia, it's India, Bangladesh. Um, in Pakistan, and we also um, work in Indonesia. And one of the things that um, we've learned is that on the access side and on the usage side, um, there's certainly a gap. And in some cases, that gap is actually growing, which is particularly concerning. But there are some um, pieces of good news. Um, so I'll start sharing the good news while we look for that slide. Um, <laughs> Uh, but what's great is this data is all available on a website called finclusion.org, which I welcome you all to go to. We have a fabulous da uh, data finder tool where you can get both the raw data if you can feel comfortable dumping it into Excel, um, but it also has a tool that allows you to run a particular things. And they have a specific infographic that's available around women's financial inclusion. So th these are three, um, I think, points of light that can hopefully motivate our work in the gender space. First headline is 570 million. This is the number of women just in the eight countries that we operate in and hold ourselves accountable for on an annual basis. So whenever we're talking to banks or mobile network operators, 570 potential new customers, that's an exciting opportunity. The next data, Point and headline um, in the bottom left-hand part um, of the screen tells us that women are experienced users of financial services for the poor. And, or, and we learned from the panel earlier today is that that's not completely understood because a lot of the saving and borrowing that's happening is in the informal sector. But imagine what's possible if you can convert um, those activities into one shared economy. Um, and then finally, in the other graph on the bottom right, what we know is that women are ready. Um, we know that they're ready both for financial inclusion and we know they're ready for digital financial inclusion. And this data represents, again, against these eight countries, um, the essential potential based on having literacy or numeracy, as well as an ID, as we know, as a passport into the financial system. Um, and then on the digital financial services side, it's measuring obviously literacy, numeracy, the ID, but also is looking at access to a phone and proficiency on how to send and receive an SMS. So I'll pause there 
and just share um, that we're really excited about these possibilities. Could you tell us the website again? Sure, it's thinclusion.org, and the organization that hosts that is Intermedia. Um, and if those of you who might be familiar already with the Global Findex, um, which Gallup implements in the field but is housed with the World Bank, it's very similar. It's just one layer um, in more detail in terms of household level analysis, and it's done annually, whereas the Findex is not done annually, but only limited to these eight countries for now. That's, I think, a great way to um, put out the landscape right now, but I. I want to go back to one thing that you said and actually have Myra and Dean comment on this. And we're very, at Women's World Bank, we're very optimistic about the future and closing this gender gap. But you said that the gender gap is growing in some markets. Why do you think that is? Uh, I don't think it's growing, but it's not. It's not. What is happening is that you have that more people are getting access to accounts overall, but the gender gap persists. Mm -hmm. That more or less is, but I think, you know, if you go into some specific markets, you may see the fact that maybe the gender gap is starting to close, particularly with access to mobile monies. Mm -hmm. but, but I think that the interesting thing is talking about data. It, we are now, you know, I'm completely convinced we have been sort of in, in terms of access to financial services, what we have been doing in the past is increasing women's, you know, trying to get women to be financially more knowledgeable, doing financial literacy training. So we're focusing on the client and seeing how women can better access financial services. We have not focused on the financial services that themselves. I am completely convinced, I mean, this is obvious, that, that any kind of service provision, particularly the productive <coughs> sectors, has biases. Our bias, because you know, the clientele forever has been met. So these productive services have been designed with a male client in mind. So how do you turn that around? And I think that one of the very important things that you need to do is provide the data to the financial institutions so that they start realizing who are the clients and you know, they start realizing if they're biased or not and why, why they're biased and then they start sort of taking action and doing designing products that are more customized to uh, the clients. Now, the big issue, I think, is how do you convince financial institutions that have to start to sex disaggregate their supply side data? It's not easy, easy, but this is one, and this is, you know, my other half hat, one of my half hats is with CDD, the other one is with Data2x. And in data to x we have just put together a coalition that includes the Global Banking Alliance for Women, it includes the IDB, the World Bank, the IMF, and it really to start getting a push to get banks to sex disaggregate their data. If we can start doing that, hopefully, you know, through both financial regulators and commercial banks, Hopefully, you know, the data will provide the evidence needed for banks to start doing things differently. And what do you think, Myra, though, I've heard from some of the banks that we work with is that they feel comfortable going after the women's segment, not necessarily because they have the data to support that, it's that they're looking across the landscape and saying, where is the growth opportunity? I'm in an increasingly competitive market. Where can I grow my business? And I know I'm not talking to this segment, the low income segment of my market, so I'm going to go after them. So in that context, it's great. They're not necessarily asking for more of that data, but I think those institutions are few and far between. So how can we leverage them to push others to move? Because that gathering of data, as you say, is very difficult to do and it requires time. 
And so if we want to move and move fast, how can we go about doing that? If, if I can answer very yeah. briefly, I mean, I think it's great those, those you know, unique institutions that are doing mm -hmm. that, but I think what, that what you want to do is have a broader movement, and that really will come, I think, from the public sector, ultimately. Mm -hmm. And there are a couple of institutions that are key. Uh, the IMF has a financial access survey. Mm -hmm. You know, the countries provide to the IMF every year data and now they're providing data also on mobile accounts. So they're, but if you start asking countries to start sex disaggregating that data, that that will motivate. I think you know. So I think that you have to have that. It's very important to have the data. I mean, and I think Findex is a perfect example of a wonderful data set. But it has to be complemented. Findex is demand side data. You have to complement it by supply side data. It's very important to have the data in order to then, you know, measure progress. You have to be able to measure progress and you have to be able to sort of benchmark and to provide accountability. Without rigorous data and, a, you know, this global basis, you will never be able to do that. And Dean, yeah, chime in here, but I've yeah. got a follow-on question for you. Yeah, so I'm curious about your first question too, yeah. but we can move on. Maybe that's a separate thing because I'm <laughs> curious to know exactly how the gap is being measured that says it's increasing and where because I'm, I, I do share some, I am skeptical. And so maybe the answer is in the nuances of how the data were collected or what the question was. But, and maybe it is. And then, then everyone has to ask what's going on in that society. Um, I'm not sure I agree with, um, I, I'm, I'm a little, I have some angst on some other things. Um, you know, it's not, you know, unless one is actually saying, let's subsidize banks to reach women, um, you have to make the business case, one of the two. So you either have to say it is more profitable and you've just been getting it wrong. Um, and, and I think there actually is a, there might be a case there to be made by going down, but it is about going low income. And in low income households, it could be that that's the business case you made, but it's a business case to make and it's not a, um, it's not saying, you know, we're going to pay for, you know, a dollar for your, if you open a women's account and not for men or some sort of mm -hmm. regulatory subsidy, something like that. Um, the other is that, you know, there is, you know, there's, so the study we did in, in Philippines, for instance, found, you know, yeah, when the women had her own account, it led to more power. Another study in Kenya found the opposite. Um, you know, it was, it was giving, giving out ATM cards for people to have easy access to their money. And when you gave it to the uh, man or joint, then they used it more. When you gave it to the woman, there was more, no more usage. The man basically grabbed the power. And that just says that like social norms are strong. And it's not so clear that you can, you, I don't know that the financial institutions are the vehicle to change the social norms. Financial institutions are a vehicle to use if the social norms allow it to be used. But it's not so clear that we should expect the banks to change social norms in society. That's, a, that's putting a lot on banks. Um, it seems like there's some other things that need to be done that are about investing in human capital for girls, creating job opportunities for girls um, um, or women. I mean, so, so they invest in girls. I mean. um, but it's not, I, I, and, and you want financial institutions to have equal access, but um, I'm, not, I'm not so sure that it's obvious to me that a financial institution should be subsidized specifically to differentiate, to differentiate there rather than make a business case. Oh, you were going to chime in, Myra? Yeah, yeah, I don't think I was saying that financial yeah. institutions right. should try to yeah. change social norms. But financial institutions, if they want to reach certain clientele, need to know who those clients are and but, what but are But why would they do that? No, but that is saying that. No. Because why, look, if it's, if it's profitable for them to reach women over men, then they will be gathering the data on their own for business interest to do that. You don't think they, you don't think, so, okay, so now, so we're just in a world of banks are not maximizing profits and they're not, they're not taking opportunities. That's fine. That's fine. That's totally consistent. It's a deeper level of make the business case. It's saying that businesses are not maximizing profits, but, but you're, you know, that's a big claim to make that, that banks are just being clueless about how they can make more money. Um, So make the business case. That's that's all I'm saying is make the business case. But 
Well, okay. So, I guess I didn't have to worry about the post lunch <laughs> snooze here. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, okay. So, let's, uh, you are touching on an issue that I want to delve into a little bit more, and that is, you know, with private sector players, their business and joining that with women's economic empowerment. Do you see, you're arguing that, you know, social norms, banks, you know, financial institutions shouldn't have a role in that. But, yeah, isn't that what you just said? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that if you're going to do yeah. it, that mm -hmm. then, well, first of all, the evidence is not strong mm -hmm. that suggests they can, mm -hmm. yeah. okay, and Fair that there's systematic things yes. to do. So right. that's the first mm -hmm. observation. So the first thing to do would be to get better evidence that there actually is a path mm -hmm. forward because we've seen things go both ways. But, um, you know, if, if there was actually a viable path to doing it and it was mm -hmm. needing a subsidy, then by all means subsidize it. But right now I don't think the evidence is there that says this is a path forward, it requires a subsidy, go, go subsidize that. That if anything, I think the evidence is stronger that says social norms are going to win out in the long run and the better thing to do is to figure out what is underlying the problem with the social norms. Is it about employment opportunities? Is it about deeper, deeper issues that are literally just societal and cultural where, where um, just that kind of social promotion and social agendas are the right path forward? And then, and then you know, financial institutions is just a path to an end. It's not, mm -hmm. That's not the end game. So it's you know if that if that happens and you empower women by giving by making it so that they are more educated, um, do have opportunities to go and have jobs, then then the banks will then they they will use the bank accounts. Well, and I think you know financial inclusion. I don't think we think of this as an end to itself. It's what can that drive, mm -hmm. and it is you know looking at can it drive better education, better health, you know better housing, um, those kind of core things, particularly for women, that are so critically important. Um, Rosita, you mentioned digital financial services earlier. So how is this, how is the digital landscape helping to change the, you know, access to finance for women and what can that do? And, you know, we've heard a little bit about how, okay, is digital financial services a silver bullet? Um, can it help close this gap? What are your thoughts on that? Um, I don't, you know, obviously there's no silver mm -hmm. bullet. I just think there is an opportunity, um, both for learning and for experiment, experimenting. So we actually think a lot about, and you know, there's this long list of kind of the top barriers. GSMA has a list, but you know, Every, a lot of different lists have been created into barriers and social and cultural norms often um, appear on those lists. So then you sit back and say, whose role is it to try to change those? Is it the government's? Is it funders from the outside? Is it um, business? And I, I think that everybody kind of has a role in changing those by experimenting. So for example, as you were speaking, um, you know, I think any, anyone from the women's economic empowerment community might say that the cha any changes should actually come from the women themselves and they should be leading this, perhaps. Um, whereas others might argue that they don't have that ability and they don't have the agency to do that. But you know, there are simple things that can be tweaked and I think digital financial services can allow us to experiment, iterate, learn, you know, change. So one example is as it relates to um, the agents. So does it matter if the agent is a man or a woman? So that's a hypothesis that business, whether it's a bank, a mobile network operator, can help us experiment. Now that's not, they're not directly attack, uh, taking mm -hmm. on a culture of social norm, but what we do know is that in some cultures, um, uh, having a female having a mobile phone might affiliate that woman with a particular industry, right? Um, and or their husband, brother, or father might not be comfortable with them having independent conversations with a male agent, independent of whatever, what the transaction is. So I do think there's an opportunity that digital provides, um, both in experimentation, it makes it cheaper to learn that, but then it also allows you to follow the money and to follow the data to see the actual impact. So again, in the conversation that was earlier, it was looking at, um, you can you know, follow the money in terms of how the money is being spent. 
digital allows you to do that. So when we work with governments and help them think about how to digitize social safety net programs, it's not just about reducing the cost of that social service provision, which is huge, specific and very measurable. Um, it's not just about reducing corruption, increasing transparency, and getting that full amount of that subsidy to that end user as quickly as possible. It's also a huge opportunity of learning of how quickly are they spending these subsidies, where and how, um, and how do you feed that information back into the system to design whatever the product or delivery channel that you're using. So I think digital presents an opportunity of reducing costs, but also increasing the opportunity of learning because it creates this digital exhaust of data. Okay. Can I just, yeah. I just want to add one thing to Maybe. the comment I made earlier, which is it's the subsidy or the business case. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't want to you know, omit okay. that and make yes. it clear that yep. if there is a business case to be made, that case needs to be made. Mm -hmm. And then everybody's happy, right? Right. Um, and but that's not a case that's always being made very well. Mm -hmm. Certainly not being heard. So if that's the case, yep. you know that's that's you know that's a path forward. Um, mm -hmm. Or find that a subsidy works and it actually achieves the goal, and then go for it. But you know without one of those two, like it's not clear to me why 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 put banks as the as the um, you know the path forward unless you're doing one of those two. Mm -hmm. I want to just. Um, add a caveat to what Rosita just said, which is, you know, following the money can be very, can lead you to the wrong answer. People don't always know what they did in a true sense with money. So we did, uh, we did this examination. One of the things that came up with microcredit is a lot of people after the studies, you know, there were eight randomized trials and this were done, and most of them measured the impacts in somewhere between the one to two and a half year zone. And ironically, although a lot of people when those came out thought, oh, the magic is all in five years, you should go longer. I, I always felt like the, the problem with those studies was that we didn't go short enough. And so we, didn't, we couldn't crisply answer the question, what was done with the money in the short run? Because we're looking at one year results. And I want to know, no, when they took out the loan, did they actually invest it or not? And things like this. So we did, we did a, a short run study in the Philippines where, um, and so you could imagine doing the same thing with social protection. What did you do with the money? We did it a few different ways. We asked people, well, first of all, the bank asked people what they did with the money. What did everyone say? I invested it, because that's what they're supposed to do with the money. Mm -hmm. Surprise, surprise. Um, we also had the surveyor say, what did you do with the money? Um, a lot of people told the surveyor, I used it to pay down other debt, and I used it to buy things in my house. Okay, then, but that's not necessarily the right answer. So then we also had treatment and control, randomization, who got credit, who didn't. And we asked, tell us about every expenditure you had in which you took cash and you did something with it for more than $20, so, you know, to get rid of small stuff, over the past 30 days. Then all of the money went into the business. So what happened to the paying down debt, which was a big piece? The debt was going to get paid down anyhow. So mechanically, they took the money from the loan. I took the money. I owe you due money. I paid you off. A surveyor comes to me and said, what did I do with the money? I say, I paid you. And that's what I say I did with money, because that's what I think I did with the money, because that's what I took. I took the cash and I paid for Zenith. But in reality, a week later, I also now had some more money. And so a week later, because I had this loan to pay back Rosita, I also had more money in my pocket. And, and so when I wanted to make some, buy some more stuff to sell in my store, I was able to buy $100 more of stuff. I don't ever attribute that thing a week later to the loan because that was just from my pocket. My loan money was used to pay off Rosita. But if I was going to pay Rosita anyhow, because she's going to hunt me down and make me pay, then even if I don't get the loan, then I turn to you and I got a loan. I did something. I fought. I, I found a way to pay down that loan. And so what we found is getting access to credit did not increase the likelihood you paid down the debt. You were going to find a way to pay that off anyhow. But it did actually lead to increased investment. Mm -hmm. um, it was a striking result not for the actual substance of it, but for the challenge of finding out when you do any sort of cash infusion to somebody, and you want to find out what they did with it, you cannot just ask them, what did you do with this money? It, they don't know the answer. And I don't mean this as an insult to people. It's just not an easy thing to know. You, you need a control group or something, like, or something that resembles a control group. Well, and I, I think, though, with digital financial services, you know, as we've seen with um, the work that we've done, and particularly working more and more with commercial banks and mobile network operators, 
is that savings is that first gateway. And so that is something that a bank will feel more comfortable than providing credit as a first product to a segment that they have never engaged with before. And so, Myra, I'm wondering, um, you know, in the digital financial services landscape and the different types of organizations you've worked with, what have you seen with regards to savings and working in that model? Yeah, let me just first comment a bit on, on, on sort of what are maybe some of the advantages of, of, mm -hmm. of digital for women. And I think digital provides something for, well, aside from, you know, reducing transaction costs, distances, whatever, it provides privacy. Mm -hmm. And the example being that you were uh, giving of the ATM that didn't work, mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, it was because the ATM, the way it was designed, the husbands could have access to the accounts. So there were individual accounts, joint accounts. Mm -hmm. The women did not use the ATM because they were afraid that the husband was going to dig into their money. So husbands use their individual accounts, women and men use joint accounts, but women did not use their individual accounts. Now, if you, however, provide privacy and security, and that means individual accounts, mm -hmm then I think that that is really sort of is a smart design that it doesn't, you know, that really helps women. And I think that you have said it best. I mean, it, it, it also works the same way with commitment accounts. Women have faced more pressures, most more ex internal and external pressures to divest some of the money that they get for businesses to give it away. If you have an individual private account, either you know through a commitment, a strong commitment, an external commitment, or it could be just even a mental labeling, that helps women. And in fact, you know, and Dean showed it. I think in the Philippines, it particularly helps those who are less empowered. So it's an incredible. I mean, I find it fascinating that is this crutch, it just helps, particularly those who are less empowered, who most of the time happen to be women, to make good decisions, make good financial decisions, and then you know be able to invest the money in their business rather than give some of the money away. So that is really, and the, now in terms of savings, savings also, and I think, you know, Dean again, I think the Philippines study was the first one that realized sort of the, the importance of savings for women. Mm -hmm. Women tend to be more risk averse than men and or maybe, it's not that they're more risk averse, but that they face a wider set of risks. And savings more so than credit is something that then you know, fits women's particular preferences and demands. So, you know, sort of targeting saving products and designing saving mm -hmm. products for women, it is probably a very smart thing to do. And there's huge demand for savings from women. And I always say, because this is a unique uh, data set, is the only data set, is a supply side data set uh, from banks in a country, and it's the country's Chile. And it turns out that uh, the Chilean government, through the first uh, government of Michelle Bachelet, uh, required all banks to provide sex disaggregated data on their, on, on their clients. They have done this over 14 years, and there's an amazing data set. 14 years for all the banks in Chile, you know, sort of, so it's, a, it's, it's the universe of banks. And you see, you know, over time, ov obviously, the number of people having bank accounts has grown, it, but the percentage of women that have savings accounts versus credit accounts, it started more than 50%, and it has just grown up. So there's a huge demand from women for savings accounts. And I think that that is something that 
sort of the commercial sector should really sort of work on and take advantage of. And because it is this, you know, it helps, I think it, it savings do fit a number of characteristics and, you know, that women have. I mean, a number of results, a number of constraints that women have, including, you know, their risk aversion and their, their sort of more precarious position where they are subject to more internal and external pressures. And being able to see then for a bank how a woman's savings behavior is does open it then up to other products. And so that you can offer a woman multi-products to meet her needs at each stage of her life. And I think, you know, we worked with a uh, commercial bank in Nigeria, Diamond Bank, and you know, we started with a very basic no frill savings account that was opened up on a mobile device in just a couple of minutes. And because they've been able to see the behavior of those women with those accounts, they're saying, okay, what are the other types of products we can now offer? And back to the point of subsidy or business case, investing millions of their own dollars in making sure that they can now grow this segment and see it as a profit center for uh, the bank. So I think there are, you know, the business cases, to your point, Dean, we absolutely need to be doing a better job of figuring that out, and particularly with the variety of different players that are now in this space because that business case may look a little different for a bank than it does for a mobile network operator, for instance. Um, Rosita, what have you seen in terms of working with different types of partners and how they're starting to engage with the women's market? Um, so a lot of uh, co-opetition. Mm -hmm. So we're noticing, you know, I think at the very beginning there was this sense that the banks and MNOs are not friends. Um, and there was some fear, as with any disruption in a market, that MNOs would be coming and taking away uh, market share. And I think now they're realizing what opportunities exist. And it kind of goes back to kind of the more macro perspective of things, and that um, the traditional equation of the business model is revenue equals price times quantity. Mm -hmm. And when you're dealing with business models for the poor, you're not focusing on the P, you're focusing on the Q, which is the volumes mm -hmm. opportunity. Um, and so I think where we see hope is that um, banks and mobile network operators are coming together, together and thinking about interoperability on a number of dimensions. So for example, in Tanzania, um, it you know, has achieved interoperability across its mobile network operators, and that was something that they, was achieved kind of market-led, not required by the government. And now um, there's progress towards interoperability between the mobile network operators and the banks. And thinking even more broadly, we're looking at what's the regional opportunity? What would happen? Um, what's possible if we were to have interoperability across all of East Africa, the same way that um, the countries in the East African community have come together and created a visa that's interoperable to kind of drive tourism and to make that process frictionless. So, um, we're actually very hopeful, certainly as a foundation, we're agnostic in terms of who the financial service provider is. Um, the world will always need banking, but not necessarily from banks. And I think both banks and mobile network operators are going to be constantly changing their identities as opportunities arise for vertical integration. And I think that's where regulations come in. So, for example, when you have a financial um, sector regulatory body that allows for both bank and non-bank financial service provision, that creates great opportunity of competition and price reduction, um, but it also creates great opportunities for interoperability. Um, and you know, on a personal note, I'm currently uh, going through the purchase of a home, and I'm every moment reminded of what a blessing I have that I can you know, do a competitive bidding war get across five institutions for my mortgage. And then once I'm done with that, I look at five different title companies and I squeeze every last dollar out of them doing that. That's kind of the dream, not just for women, but for everyone, is that it shouldn't really matter who your financial service provider is. It should be more about the quality, the safety, um, and just kind of integrity so that people are making the best decisions that they can on the use of those 
financial services, for health, for education, and that process is frictionless and as cheap as possible. There is a, a combination of what, what, is, what Myra is saying as it applies to this point you're making on digital, on savings versus credit, mm -hmm. um, that I think we need to remember. You know, I think of digital credit as, you know, difference in savings. Savings, unambiguous, you know. I do think we need to do important experimentation the way you're describing about privacy and things like that mm -hmm. and, you know, secret accounts and things like this that might, might be very good. But on the credit side, you know, the idea of three clicks on your cell phone and getting a loan is really exciting mm -hmm. and really scary. <laughs> um, I, I remember, this was 1999, I was in graduate school. It was my first one. I was starting up two field projects. One of them was my first experience setting up a randomized trial. And we're trying to get funding. It was for a micro lender in South Africa, Inca. And they said to me, oh, we have this donor that's really into um, HIV issues. Can you package this impact evaluation as about HIV? And, and they're like, well, yeah, because, you know, get access to a loan, it empowers women, and then they can say, you know, no to a man um, about unprotected sex, and there you go. And I remember, you know, I'm in grad school, my job's to kind of, and I'm like, you know, I could tell a story that goes the other way. <laughs> I, I get a loan, I have to pay back this loan, I'm screwed because the interest rate is really high, and so, no pun intended, I now engage in transactional sex. Um, in order to get the money to repay this loan, and you know, it might not be like you know street prostitution, but effectively transactional sex with a, a sugar daddy kind of person to get the money. And you could easily imagine the story going completely the other way, if I take out a loan that I really should not have and didn't fully understand the cost of repaying and the risks that I was facing in life as to whether I would have the money to repay. And you could tell, you know, stories can talk, go both ways on this one. So you know, obviously, I didn't write the second one and to them this grant proposal, we didn't get the grant, that's not the point. Um, but the, you know, the point is, there's a risk. Um, and you could easily imagine um, giving women access, anybody for that matter, but obviously this is a conference where it's focused on gender issues, um, but give a woman access to credit without proper disclosures as to what that loan is, how much it costs, what are the, the fees and things like that, which is the world we're entering into with, with digital credit, where we have to think hard about how are we going to make sure there's a true meeting of the mind and the, bar, and the borrower truly understands what they're getting, getting into? Um, and the minute people are taking out loans they don't fully understand is the minute you actually exacerbate gender problems when it's women take, getting into debt problems. Um, and it's, you know, I want to be clear, it, it's also a problem when men get into debt problems, mm -hmm. but that's not the topic of this conference. So. Mm -hmm. um, well, and I, I wonder though that when, you know, one of the challenges I think in digital financial services, you have this benefit of bringing the bank to her, bringing the financial institution to her. That's what digital allows. But how do you ensure though that there's a human element to this? And we hear this from women in a variety of markets that we talk to is that they love the convenience of being able to do something on their phone or go to an agent, but that human contact and knowing that there's a face to the bank, the TD North that does those ads, you know, for uh, you know having a human face, it's that combination. We can't forget that connection that has to happen. And in this example here, then what can that role be for that human face in providing the digital and financial literacy? that um, is needed, particularly for the women's markets. Um, Myra, have you seen anything um, from the digital and financial education standpoint that, you know, different ways of delivering in a digital world? That no, but, mm -hmm. it, but, it, but I was going to talk yeah. a bit about, and you know, again, sort of focusing on how these services are provided. Uh, what one we're running now, uh, two randomized control trials, one mm -hmm. in Tanzania and one in Indonesia. Uh, uh, the Indonesia one is working with Bank Mandiri, mm -hmm. that is the largest public bank in the country. And, you know, on the demand side the, with the women clients, we're providing some financial literacy training, okay. but there is, mm -hmm. it turns out that, you know, the government of uh, Indonesia has uh, put out 
a, a policy some time ago already to promote branchless banking mm -hmm. in the country. Banks are starting uh, to give uh, to give uh, loans and savings through digital uh, services. So what we're doing though on the supply side with bank agencies, we're providing we're going to be providing incentives, different levels of incentives of bank age to bank agents to reach clients. Mm. And we are instructing all bank agents of the importance of targeting women clients. Mm -hmm. And I think it's going to be very interesting mm -hmm. to see the effect of incentives right. to the agents to reach more clients mm -hmm. and hopefully more women clients. And one obviously of the things that we're going to be doing also is seeing, you know, men agents and female agents, and mm -hmm. if that makes a difference. Right. There's a really interesting study, a uh, recent study by the bank. I think it was, it was researchers from the bank, I remember. It's, it's an agricultural extension. But they trained farmers, male and female <coughs> farmers, to on a new, uh, I think it was on a new crop or a new seed. And these farmers then had to train you know, becoming mm -hmm. communicators, extension communicators. And the female farmers were better trainers because, you know, then the people who, tra who they trained ended up having higher yields. But people did not want to be trained by the female farmers. And they just you know, they believed that the female farmers were going mm -hmm. to be worse trainers, despite the fact that, in fact, they were better trained. So they provided small incentives, and that made the difference. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it, it, was, it was the nudge that really right. sort of changed. And at the end of the experiment, you know, the, uh, the people trained by the female farmers, their yield had increased by 5% over the others, it was significant. So I think that those kinds of things are not that difficult to do. Right. Mm -hmm. And they may really make a difference. Yeah. And I it's think, you know, comparing, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 comparing from market to market, um, we uh, did an analysis of the agents in Nigeria and whether it did make a difference, whether it's male or female agents. and. Uh, found no difference for the women clients. Um, however, for the male clients, you can probably guess they actually like saving better with the woman agent because they saw it as showing off and uh, really showing off their masculinity and their earning potential. Um, and you know, we heard some stories from female agents that you know, they would say, oh, what are you saving for to a male client? And they'd say, oh, a helicopter. And so, of course, they were saving for a helicopter. Uh, so they thought that was very impressive and that the women agents would be very impressed by that. So uh, in uh, Nigeria, you did not uh, see a difference um, in terms of savings behavior uh, for the women clients. But we did see it for the men. Um, so probably an interesting thing to look at in different markets, too, is that, you know, also for male clients, you know, um, what is the impact of gender on agents? We had a similar result yeah. in the Philippines yeah. too. With um, it wasn't on gender, but it's the same basic idea in the sense that it was on just poverty. And so there was a bunch of credit officers, and they have some preconceived notion as to who's profitable. Their incentives are on loans and volume and repayment, but the the, the management wanted them to reach poorer clients and, and go downscale. So in the same way mm -hmm. that, you know, it was a program that says, no, we want you to reach women rather than men, right? And here it's, we want you to reach poor rather than less poor. But they didn't provide incentives. They provide training in how to target the poor. Right. What was the consequence? Oh, yeah, they targeted the poor. Out. <laughs> they used the improved targeting methods to decide who not to lend to and it went more upscale and used it as a filter. Right. Um, I mean, not explicitly 100%, but it was a clear clear that the, that the people, the, the credit officers who got training in targeting the poor um, had wealthier clients than the ones who did not. So it's the same basic punchline, and, but there, you know, there's no incentive. We didn't say to them, and we'll give you an extra dollar for everybody who's mm -hmm. below the following line. 
right? That would have been the thing to, if we had done that, it would have matched perfectly. So I can't tell you a rosy end story. I mean, you have a rosy end to your story. But the same basic idea. If there's a preconceived notion about who's more profitable than not, unless you change that incentive, if you highlight that difference, you might actually exacerbate the problem yeah. rather than ameliorate it. Were you gonna, I was yeah. just gonna say one yeah. thing, um, just thinking about this point of the human interaction. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one of the digital opportunities is also the opportunity to increase the velocity of transactions. And particularly um, for people who are familiar with kind of networks, uh, the power of networks and kind of the network effect, um, there is a researcher at American University who's been kind of studying in Kenya and a couple of other countries what the opportunities are and has done kind of deep analysis and, and, and identify these nodes. So what does a financial network look like across women? And um, I was thinking, you know, we're right now awaiting the results of some studies that's uh, looking at what happens in major defense savings groups or graduation programs and what opportunities kind of pros and cons. Mm -hmm. Similarly, disruptions it'll cause. But I think one thing that there's no question about is with digital financial services, the velocity is going to increase. But it's not just the flows of finan financial flows, but there's also another highway, which is the information highway, right? Um, and so my ability to manage a shock, my ability to share good news, um, all of that increases, both on the negative and positive side. And I wonder um, if that help, helps to overcome some of the decrease in kind of the human interaction but uh, increasing the velocity and the frequency of those two highways of both information and financial flows, could that perhaps increase nearness in a way that actually doesn't re require physical interaction? Because um, there is something about being able to send a message and instantly be able to hear back or maybe even instantly be able to get a remittance sent to you in, in order to um, respond to a shock that you're facing that might actually feel a certain level of closeness than traveling the distance or being face to face with someone. I think that's an area maybe we can experiment and learn with together, both the economic empowerment community as well as the financial inclusion community. I'm going to ask the panelists one more question before opening it up, um, and I'm guessing people are going to have lots of questions. Um, so here we are, we you know have talked quite a bit about digital financial services for women, um, but recognizing that there are gaps recognizing that um, you know there needs to be more of a business case, some more research on this. Where are we going to be five years from now on this topic? <laughs> Who wants to jump in first? <laughs> Who's got their crystal ball out there? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't tell them I was asking this. <laughs> I'll be short, I don't know. Yeah, okay. <laughs> answer. <laughs> well, I was going to say, I mean, I am really sort of, I have been uh, incredibly uh, impressed by the quality of the evidence that we're mm -hmm. having. And I think that if evidence leads to better policy, mm -hmm. and you know, five years from now, we are going to be sort of providing better services mm -hmm. and better services for the poor and better services for women, and we will be, we will be doing things in a much smarter way. Hopefully, I mean the 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 evidence has improved so dramatically in the past three mm -hmm. to five years. I mean, it, you know, we used the area of gender used to be filled with anecdotes. We used to do things because you know, sort of it was anecdotal. But now we have hard evidence. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, now we have to turn that evidence into policy, and people have to use evidence to base policy. That's a big challenge, <laughs> definitely. But you know, I'm hopeful. I mean, I'm hopeful that we're going to be doing things in a smarter way. I'm excited. I think um, the women's economic empowerment community and financial inclusion community um, are going to be working closer together where both communities are using each other's indicators, strategies, and approaches, and just really being learning and doing together. Um, I'm excited and hopeful that we will have a chance to have 
data parties and triangulate data from the supply side and demand side. I hope the IMF, if they're watching or listening, Have you ever been to a data party? <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting for my invite. Yeah. <laughs> These are crazy gatherings. But I, you know, I, I would love like there to be data hackathons that bring the supply side and demand side of sex disaggregated data from the Data 2X project and others. Um, and also just, I think, in five years, that's a realistic time to see more companies and countries have strategies, have targets, have goals that are gender specific. I, I really do believe that. Okay, I'll change my answer to theirs. <laughs> <laughs> in, in particular, the data parties. I'm all for that. <laughs> so we will be having the data parties. Okay, so can I open it up for questions now? Why don't we take a couple at a time? I take here and... Thank you. I really enjoyed this session. Um, I want to ask this of Myra, but the rest of you can comment. I mean, I we're so excited that Chile has this sex disaggregated data, and they've mandated it from the government. I mean, there are very few countries that have that. Um, my sort of takeaway would be you need female leadership to bring that change through in government, because I know in the United States, I was at Global Banking Alliance Summit recently, and next to me was sitting a woman from a very prominent bank in the United States who had been thinking about gathering sex disaggregated data, but they're concerned about lawsuits, you know, that will just open it all up. So I'm just wondering about your comments and the rest of the panel about how we could encourage these mandates, you know, at the governmental level. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Get rid of the lawyers. You know, I, you I will to? chime in on yeah. one thing. Um, so the Alliance for Financial Inclusion, with AFI, which is the global body of um, central bank regulators around the world, they recently at their annual meeting um, passed a declaration around uh, policies for financial inclusion, recommendations for its members to adopt. And one of them was the gender disaggregated data. And so the members as a whole, you know, passed this mandate, uh, well, mandate's too strong of a word, but these recommendations. And so, you know, each country now, you know, hopefully we'll be looking at that. So I'd like to say we'll start to see more of that. Um, we did some research a couple years ago, so this is a bit out of date on how many countries did have the gender disaggregated data as part of their policy frameworks, and I believe it was five or six. I Now, I think think we may be up to around 20 or so. So I think even in the last couple of years, there's been some improvement. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to mention that yeah. the Alliance for Financial yeah. Inclusion uh, is part of our group also. But I mean, you're very right on the point that commercial banks are leery to disaggregate, sex disaggregate their data because of issues of lawsuits. And that's why you have to have the public sector come in and the financial regulators. How it was done in Chile, yes, it was, it was Bachelet in her first government that mandated this. It was very interesting how it was done the first year. The first year, Chile has a very good civil registration system. So because the banks didn't have mm. the sex <laughs> disaggregation of the data on individual accounts. They have done it only on individual accounts now. They use the civil registration system to match and decide on the sex of the individual account mm -hmm. holder. In later years, the bank, so, and then, you know, that was the first, the first one or two years. And then, you know, the commercial banks, all the banks had to provide this to the, to the financial regulator. And then the banks automatically started doing it themselves. So there was sort of a, you know, a culture was created. Mm -hmm. And it happened. And then and they built this anonymized database. And that's key. It has to be anonymized, mm -hmm. obviously. And you know, so that, that every every commercial bank can feel, you know, that, that they can provide the data. Mm -hmm. yeah. And just mm -hmm. one similar on that. I think you hit it in that it, it takes leadership, it takes intention, and it takes funding. Some of the other countries, mm -hmm. um, Rwanda, PNG. Kind of surprising, um, but not every situation is going to have all three of those. And so we just, as a community, need to work together. But I've 
kind of feel like it really does require leadership. I just want a clarification. When you say anonymized, do you mean the household anonymized or the bank is anonymized no. too? The, 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 the household. Bank. The bank. The banks. The banks send. The banks send so it's not even known which bank no. is sending the data. So no. that's truly anonymized. So the, so can't, the, the point right. being that you can't sue right. the bank because no one right. knows which bank it right. is. And there's no way to back that up. Well, I'm sure that, that the financial regulator right. knows, but they publish yeah. the data that they publish is completely anonymous. Yeah. It's over, you know, it's, yeah. So then I say there's one other factor that's needed. I don't know how to solve this. I've never really, to be honest, I've, it's, not, it's not an issue I've personally mm -hmm. been engaged in. So, But you need a, some sort of political commitment, too. I mean, the risk that I would think a bank is concerned with is not is, is lawsuit, but also just regulatory action. You know, regulatory action that just says, look, you, you know, you don't have, you, you have too many loans to men, not women, where the bank's response would be, look, that's society, that's not us, we're not doing anything other than making loans available, we have an objective credit scoring, here's what it is, and there's an issue in society that's leading to this. And so a bank would be like, why, you know, don't pick on me, pick on society. Um, and, and so then it's like giving ammunition to that type of regulatory thing. So even if there's not an immediate intent to regulate, how do you assure the bank that we're not gonna, the, the governments are not going to use the data at some point to pass regulatory action that forces them into less than profit maximizing behavior, um, given societal good, issues? And I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I'm just, uh, um, yeah. but I'm just saying, I think there's, you know, it's not just, I, I just add that to the list right. that you named as mm -hmm. to the things that need to be thought through. And, yeah. But it's very hard for politicians to commit to anything. I mean, you know. Um, Henrietta, I think you were going to chime in on this. Mm -hmm. uh, you, yeah. Yeah. Oh, there's. Uh. Henrietta Korb from the IFC. I think I'm on the wrong panel. I should have been on your panel, um, <laughs> because obviously we are, you know, trying to build a business case quite forcefully with our commercial banks, and we have 900 of them that we're investing in. Um, but just to your point on the regulatory side, and I think one step is indeed to obviously ask banks to sex disaggregate their data, and then obviously publish it at the aggregate level because there's obviously confidentiality issues and challenges. But we've seen countries take a step further which partially then can undermine the business case, i.e., for example, in Bangladesh, where you have a mandate and as a bank now to at least 25% of your portfolio have to go to women or enterprises. So if that's being instituted overnight, it could potentially lead to obviously banking women or enterprises that might not necessarily be able to actually repay the loans and actually drive up NPL rates. And then you have a counter effect that says, look, if you give women at the SME level, you know, loan investment, they're not able to um, return it. So that's one in Sri Lanka has just passed, you know, 5% has to go in women-owned enterprises. And then you're like, almost like, well, what is the sort of ceiling? Why 5%? What signal does that set to the market? So a lot of question marks, you know, are only 5% mm -hmm. bankable? I mean, so, so I think there's a lot more research to be done. What are sort of sensible targets, if at all? Uh, what definitions to use? Because obviously as we start sex disaggregating data from our clients, what is a woman enterprise in Sri Lanka might differ you know, entirely to Bangladesh, to Nepal, and then might differ from bank to bank. So you're comparing often apples and pears, and that poses extra challenges. Mm -hmm. So anyway, and there's tons of data on the business case that we're trying to put together, Bank of Lebanon, BHD Bank in Dominican Republic. Um, but the fundamental challenge remains. The majority of clients are not sex disaggregating any data, neither in insurance nor in banks non-digital, whatever it is, it's just not done. And not always for the reason that it would be discriminatory, most often for the reason that it's lack of generally client data gathering and capabilities on the data collection side. And we are not pushing clients overly to actually sex disaggregate it more if we're not doing anything with the data. Because often I think we're all fantastic in saying we need more data, need more data, need more data. Mm -hmm. But oftentimes we're not really acting on it. And I think that can really turn our commercial clients off if we just you know gather it but then actually leave it dormant in terms of activating responses to how can they potentially close gaps between men and women. Sorry, I went yeah. on a bit. Oh, that was perfect. Okay, a couple more questions here. Uh, here and then over here. Yeah, good afternoon. Thank you so much for your presentation. My name is Rosemary Segera. I'm the president of Segera's International Group. We just had such a session at the World Bank annual meeting uh, where we had the CAMSA, Microsoft, and other IT 
uh, guy talking about financial inclusion. And looking at uh, what you just dis discussed, I think uh, while at the World Bank I talked about the protection and the uh, privacy of digital. It has really helped. Uh, I come from Kenya where we are. Kenya was one of the countries, the first countries on digital transfers. So this digital transfer has saved people. My mother was beaten because of Western Union. They steal from her. You can't go. So f meeting physical was horrible. And this is where more violence came in. But since the digital privacy, your PIN number, what is on the phone, it has saved my mother. It has mm -hmm. saved people from being stolen money and being beaten. So the digital transfer is the best. The question is, uh, with Microsoft and uh, you, looking at uh, inclusion, we have d women with a disability like the TEF, the blind, uh, my own son is TEF. How do we include these people <laughs> with the digital transfers? I, I opened my son a bank account because they, they don't uh, have much information on digital. So how do we include them into training? Africa in the rural areas, we have digital cell phones. So this education could be done. So how do you support us and how do we work together to make sure the people with the disability, women, young people, and just people are, have the knowledge of using digital? Because we're not just going to give somebody a cell phone and say the money is there. They would be looking at the cell phone. They don't know if there is money or no money and if they are deaf. So it's very complicated. So we need to include people with disability, deaf, blind, and everybody else into the digital finances. How do we work on that and work together to make sure everybody is included into the financial system? Thank you. OK. And here? Hi, thanks. Uh, Susana Martinez from Fedesarrollo, Colombia. I have two questions, points. One is that it's very interesting about the disaggregated data in Colombia. We were we we're doing um, an impact evaluation on a program by the bank Opportunity Banks, um, ma managing to make women trying to make women safe more. And one of the things that happened, and that happened also to IPA in Colombia, because we were doing two impact evaluations. One was called Lista, the one IPA, is that we managed that the banks, uh, two banks, uh, gave gave us the information. But because of Abea's data, the protection of the data, they anonymized it before they gave it to us. <laughs> so basically, <coughs> we ended up having behavioral measures and perception measures. Uh, but we cannot really point out. Uh, we just know if there was a joint effect with the treatment and control group. We cannot know the differences by municipalities, by the f by states, by anything because of the abeyas data. So that's like an, an additional problem that comes after we begged the bank. It took us a lot of time. We are late like a year. And finally we got it, but because of, of the another law by the government to protect the day, uh, the, um, the identity of these people that many are displaced by violence and can, can be killed or something, um, we cannot really make good policy recommendations. So that's one point that I think like the next level when we get there, we get separated data, what comes afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, and the second point is that I think something that was missing from the panel and it was brought out in the previous panel was uh, the, the need to know more about gender asset gaps. For example, we know we had a, an evaluation of a program by USAID in Colombia, in two states in Colombia, and we find out that a lot of the problems for women to access, e access microloans from the agrarian bank in rural areas in Colombia was uh, the fact that they didn't have collaterals. So, or the collaterals are in the name of the husbands. And we have a huge problem with uh, land ownership in Colombia, overall, men and women, but it's worse for women. And so there's a lot of land informality. That's why we have a conflict, civil conflict, for 60 years. And, and those that have um, the papers showing that the land is theirs is mainly the men. And we are not that bad as some sub-Saharan sub African. It seems that it's worse. So I think that one of the things that we really need to measure, taking into account the things that, OK, is, mar is market driven. Banks are maybe not uh, thinking that women can pay back. We need to understand also how collaterals are playing a role in that and trying to measure uh, gender asset gaps. Uh, it, it, there's a very interesting project. I don't know if you know it. 
uh, by Princeton and the University of Florida, I think, that is trying to measure this in Ecuador, in Ghana, and in some states in India, where they ask not at a household level, but at individual level, what is going on with uh, assets. And they ask for everything, not only land, but pigs and television, which is very complicated because you can't really buy a pig. But they are trying to measure it, so that's really interesting. Um, does anyone um, want to tackle sure. building a more inclusive, like the first question, um, digital for you know as inclusive as possible? Yeah. I was just going to address, uh, say something slightly yeah. different on the first one, which is yeah. I mean, obviously I don't know the specifics of what the issues were there, but a lot of times when we deal with that issue about data privacy, one solution is to actually not ever get the data at all, but embed an analyst with them. And all you need is the output of the data, the analysis. So we, we have dealt with that type of situation by in the US with government data that's, that's um, private, wh where you're actually on the government server doing the analysis. And then all you ever take with you outside is the, you know, the, the results of the analysis. And, and they just won't let you, they won't let you access. But they do have all the data, and it's not, it's not a merger issue. It's that they won't. E they just won't do the analysis themselves. I'm happy to take the inclusion one. Um, we've been encouraged. I recently learned about an organization um, called Sinu. The original company is Minibuzz, and they operate in a couple of countries in East Africa. And they're creating um, learning programs for people who are illiterate. So things, learning that are driven more with um, pictures and other um, ways. And so I think, I think the next evolution will be for other types of disabilities. And so I'm pretty hopeful that because of the innovation that technology affords and encourages, um, that we will be finding other ways um, to be able to reach people of various abilities and disabilities. I just wanted to make the comment on data, and I think I, I think you know it's a more general comment that, as you know, we are talking about the data revolution, and now you know private sector has all this data that can be used for development purposes. I think, and you know, Shada that is here, you know, we need sort of better rules for both transparency and open data, as well as privacy. And I think that that, that there's really the need for an international set of rules that makes sense in terms, and, and we have to go beyond sort of the traditional sets of data the national NSOs had, and we really have, you know, because of the private sector coming in with that data, there, there's, that's long overdue. The other point, I think that if somebody brought it up, I think you, you Henrietta, did that is terribly important is data has to be used. If we're not going to use data, we better not gather data. I think we have time for two more questions. So here and back here, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Mindy Reiser. I'm a sociologist. I've worked in many different worlds and many different cultures. But I have a question about the bankers and what kind of guidance they're giving. Um, obviously, there are banks that focus on cooperatives. But when one isn't going to such an entity, are there bankers who would steer women in that direction? And also, we are focused now on sustainability and enterprises that are cognizant of carbon, carbon footprints and a whole lot of other issues. What's going on there? What kind of guidance are those who are supporting enterprises giving to women to think about these sorts of things? It's not just the, the quantity of the money, it's what is being done with the money and that, how that's contributing to a world that is more self-sufficient, more ergonomically conscious, and so on. Uh, yeah, with respect to the question of um, banks and um, incentives, or how do you incentivize them, or help them to change, are they even should they even be involved in the process of changing social norms? I wonder whether any of you have looked at the Community Services Reinvestment Act uh, and that model 
which was used to get banks to begin to look at, this is some years ago, actually a couple of decades ago, to begin to look, take a second look at just low income uh, population or, and um, you know, to, to, en to encourage banks to begin to look at a population that pays, you know, they pay their bills, they pay their utility bills. How do you assess credit worthiness when people may not have the credit score that a bank may typically look at, but they are leading credit worthy lives because they're paying their bills and that type of thing. And it actually uh, provided a framework for a number of banks to set up programs that would begin to outreach and provide uh, programs for lower income folks. So I don't know if any of you are familiar with that, and if so, could it provide a model um, you know, in the context of gender inclusion, please? Okay. Um, tackling, I, I guess, the dilemma. I, I mean, I can say something very brief yeah. about that, but it's brief, and um, I, I do remember being a little bit familiar with the literature on the Community Reinvestment Act when I was in graduate school, so 20 years. Almost, God, I'm older than I realize. <laughs> um, and, and it was mixed. It was certainly not effusively positive, um, nor effusively negative. There was m mixed evidence on whether it was having any impact or not. Um, um, I don't know whether better work has been done since, you know, I, I just remember exploring it a little back then. And with regards to the first question on guidance for um, entrepreneurs and... I, yeah. I guess more um, opportunities. So for example, we're seeing pay-as-you-go models as it relates to the ability to pay certain bills or to acquire certain assets like solar panels um, that are more environmentally friendly. And so I think what we've seen is how digital is providing products um, and services that allow in, allow for increased access to even have the option to use these things. Um, and I think there's no question that um, through the phone, there's an opportunity to receive information. And that information could be the price of a crop for a farmer. It could be um, you know, weather-related information. Um, and maybe in the future, even the poor can get financial advice or information where they get an alert that says, you've already spent more than you intended to spend on this or um, the remittance that you just got, you get a text message that says, do you want to save some of it instead of cash it out? So um, I think digital affords the opportunity um, for either the providers to provide this information or kind of financial guidance. Do we have time for, nope, okay. No. We don't have time for any more. I just got the woo. <laughs> I wish we had much more time. I want to thank our panelists today. I think it was a great discussion. Yeah, OK. Um, so um, my name is uh, Kalpana Kochar. I am the director of HR at the IMF. And I feel like before I, I moderate this panel, I have to say a few words about why on earth, the IMF is moderating a panel on, <laughs> on uh, women's economic empowerment, and in case some of you are wondering. But I know some of you know the work that we've been doing. So let me just say, at the IMF, I have actually had the privilege of doing a lot of the new work that the fund uh, uh, has, been, has embarked on, on the macroeconomic imperative for gender equality. We, we take a macroeconomic lens to this issue, we, uh, we, we do try to distinguish ourselves from other, pe other commentators in this area, uh, notably our colleagues across the street at the World Bank and at the IFC. And some of you may know our managing director, Christine Lagarde, has really championed this issue. And I dare say, initially, there was you know, uh, resistance, as there is always, to change. Um, but but she continued to push us and challenge us. And so we have actually begun to do uh, what I consider to be quite useful uh, work. Um, as I said, we take a macroeconomic lens. So we answer questions like, what are the macroeconomic impacts of, of uh, uh, gender inequality? Uh, and what macroeconomic policy levers tend to work to promote gender, inequal uh, gender equality? This is not to say that there are other 
not other very important, maybe even more important levers uh, to, uh, to empower, to uh, enhance women's economic empowerment. But we think that we add value when we when we remain within our mandate, which is unique, but also it allows us to speak to a different audience. We speak to macroeconomic policymakers who are normally not the audience for these issues. And so finance ministers, central bank governors, these are not the people you normally think of as, as being confronted with these issues. So we do think we're also broadening the, the, the audience for this debate in that manner. Um, and, and, and as I said, we are focused, of course, on public policy levers. But we are very mindful that the private sector, not, you know, public policy can only go so far, very important, but can only go so far. And the, the private sector certainly plays a very important role. And so that's what this, uh, this uh, panel uh, is, is going to be uh, discussing for the most part. Let me do a quick introduction of the panel. Uh, some of you may know uh, people here. Uh, to the, my far right is Arancha Gonzalez. And she's an expert in international trade issues with more than 20 years of experience um, in, the, in the area. She serves as the executive director of the International Trade Center since 20, September 2013. She has written extensively on international trade and economics. And she has broad experience in trade and development matters in the public and the private sector. She was before this uh, uh, the chief of staff to the World Trade Organization's uh, Director General Pascal Lamy, who you all might know, served there for many years, eight years, I believe. So uh, a real expert on uh, trade issues, but in particular on how trade can be used to promote gender equality. Uh, next to her is, is Henriette Kolb. She's the head of the Gender Secretariat of the International Finance Corporation, a member of the World Bank Group. And she serves as the advocate for gender equality issues in the private sector, leads a team that works with IFC's clients to include both women and men as entrepreneurs, employees, consumers, et cetera. Uh, uh, Henriette and I have, have had previous occasions to discuss our work together, so I'm very happy to see her here. Charles Kenny, to my immediate right, is a senior fellow at the Center for Global Development. Maybe many of you know him. But his current work uh, focuses on gender and development, the role of technology in development, governance and anti-corruption, and the post-2015 development agenda. So uh, Charles was also before at the World Bank, so um, um, you know someone who's very well uh, wide in his experience. So I mean, there's there's more details about us uh, in the um, in the um, uh, handout out front, so I won't go into more detail and rather use the time to get into the discussion. Um, we have about um, a little over an hour. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so what, what, what we'll do is we'll have a discussion here for maybe 50 or so minutes. And we'll make sure we leave enough time for you all to ask questions at the end. Um, so you know, um, start writing down your questions as soon as we start speaking. <laughs> um, so. Let me start with you, Arancha, if you don't mind. Um, just talk, tell us a little bit of how, what you see as the sort of the link between trade, international trade, and women's economic empowerment. And then as a, once you, you know, before we get to sort of what policies you think will work, I want to also ask you, once you've laid out the case for trade and women's economic empowerment, whether you worry about the, all the talk, not just here, but in, in really globally about protectionism, the rise of protectionism, and, and, and basically what we can do as, as, as both commentators and public policy advisors to, you know, to, to, to make the case to continue to have open trade. Well, thank you very much. Let me start by saying that uh, I couldn't uh, have chosen a better moderator for this session uh, <laughs> in the uh, person of Kalpana and the IMF behind Kalpana, because this discussion is about the economy, too. So uh, one uh, angle of uh, women's empowerment that we haven't really thought through in the last 30 years is the one that concerns the economy. We have focused a lot, rightly so, on education, on health care, on political representation, on violence against women. But we haven't focused enough on what may, will make 
progress in all these areas anchored sustainably for the future, which is called the economy. Now, what do I see? So from that point of view, they couldn't have chosen a better moderator, <laughs> frankly. <laughs> and I incidentally think that the IMF stepping into this debate is extremely important to change the conversation into one that matters for all countries around the world. I represent an international development organization that belongs both to the World Trade Organization and the United Nations. Wherever I go, every minister that I meet, every head of state that I meet, wants more and better growth for his or her country. And uh, when they say so, uh, then the door is open for me to argue that one way to make for better, more and better quality of the growth is to embed the asset that women represent that very often is not leveraged in the economy. So what do I see when I look at uh, this world of trade uh, from, uh, uh, from where I see it? What I see is very few women-owned businesses participating in international trade. And when I look at why is it that they don't participate in international trade, and incidentally, it matters that a company participates in international trade. So going back to uh, the end of your question, only the most competitive participate in international trade. And when you participate in international trade, you become even more competitive. And competitiveness matters. Because if you're at the bottom of the pyramid, if you're in the informal sector, meaning if you're not competitive, then the likelihood that your contribution to the economy would be big. The likelihood that your labor rights will be good, robust, and respected, the, the possibility of leveraging your contribution to the economy is much smaller. So it matters. Now, what do I see when I look at uh, women in trade is very few, and this has to do with their size. Women own businesses are smaller in size. And the question we have asked ourselves in the International Trade Center is, is this a smallness in size by design, by choice, or by default? Because if you choose to be small, fine, fair enough. But if you're forced into smallness because some things don't work, then we've got an issue. So we have identified five reasons why women in business are smaller in size. Number one, it's got to do with laws. No need uh, for me to expand on that. The World Bank has done amazing uh, work at capturing the laws that uh, discriminate wh women compared to men in business. Two, even when the laws are the same, procedural obstacles are not the same. So in a recent report we've put out uh, analyzing SME competitiveness and standards, we find that the standard is the same, but the manner in which this standard is going to be applied to a woman in business compared mm -hmm. to a man in business is not the same. You're likely to be bribed more. You're likely to be made to wait more. So legal, procedural, uh, three, financial. I will not go into that uh, because you've just had a panel uh, to discuss that. Financial has a lot to do with assets. And assets in many cases cannot be owned by women. You don't have assets. You don't have collateral likelihood that you will have access to credit. At reasonable conditions, is lower. Fourth, networks. Women in business have less networks than men in business. Fifth and final, very important, one on which we all have something to do is culture. Culture, culture. Culture that doesn't, for example, recognize unpaid work that women uh, do at home, uh, with the kids, uh, with the parents, with the grandparents. So this combination of factors, and there is not one, there is a combination of factors. This is why this issue is difficult to solve and requires us thinking and acting in this multidimensional way. This puts women into the category of smaller in size. Smaller in size means less competitive. Less competitive means less participation in international trade equals less competitive. So that, I hope, has laid my case. <laughs> Thank you, um, Arantxa. Henriette, um, let me ask you from the point, you know, your, your uh, vantage point from the International uh, Finance Corporation, 
Where do you think the private sector has made gains in closing gender gaps at the firm level? Mm. And where do we need to do more if we're going to make progress in less than two centuries? <laughs> you don't have to wait 170 day, uh, years indeed. Um, so just picking on actually from what Arant has said in our previous panel, so clearly to echo that indeed the IMF really working on the macro level has helped us on the private sector level having these conversations. So why is that? Because obviously firms are looking at sort of five communities they're engaging with. One is their leadership, second one is their workforce, third one is their supply base, their entrepreneurs, fourth is their consumers, and fifth is their community stakeholders. And so to your point, Kapana, when we look at certain sectors, you can close gaps in all of these five dimensions, but some of those dimensions there's been more attention diverted to, whereas others have completely gone unrecognized. And I think the conversation that we connect and she trades brings in is the supply chain um, work. Mm -hmm. And I think there we have tons more work to do. I mean, Great. tons more work to do. There's a complete lack of understanding as to why it matters to have a supply chain that's diverse, who is in my supply chain, what means supply chain strengthening. So huge vast gaps in both in terms of research and data that we can gather from companies. But secondly, also then how do we then deploy gender smart solutions across the supply chain? I think we've only started to scratch the surface and we really need a sort of ecosystem approach to tackle that. When we talk about corporate leadership, and the IMF has done terrific work around this um, as well in terms of European markets in particular, and we have just done quite a lot on the emerging markets and on Jordan and others, we have mixed evidence, and if you know it, the doing business report that has just come out from the World Bank um, that integrated for the very first time three gender dimensions. One is starting business, second is the um, use and transfer and uh, registration of property, and the third one is the actual um, uh, civil court, whether your voice is the same or opinion based the same than your male counterpart. We haven't included yet corporate leadership because there is still some sort of question marks around data sets. Mm -hmm. um, however, we believe very strongly at IFC there's enough data points to make very clear to our clients that they should have diverse boards. But that conversation has sort of happened very much in developed markets and hasn't quite arrived at sort of the 2,000 clients that we invest in. So we're helping our clients really understand where can they make gains by closing gaps on the board level, and not just from a gender perspective, but clearly that's one dimension. Coming to the workforce, you might have seen just last week, huge announcement, one of the biggest mining companies in the world, BHP mm -hmm. Billiton, 50% of our workforce by 2020 have to be women. So you can see how companies, in particular male-dominated companies, are increasingly put at high price on retention, promotion, and recruitment of women in order to remain and stay competitive. So having just come back from Sri Lanka, and I know you were just there, the sectors, garment, plantation, dire shortages of labor, and women drop out of the labor force, 35% are only participating. Huge challenges when women get married, not just when they have kids, but actually when they get married, drop out. At the same time, massive demographic changes in terms of aging population and out migration into the Gulf. Mm -hmm. So if the sectors want to be competitive, the only chance they really have, and that's what we help our clients understand is, looking at employment practices that treat men and women the same that close the wage gap, that have retention policies related to childcare or related to flexible work or related to part-time work. But all these things to say is there's still tons of work to do on the workforce, not just about the number of jobs, but also about the quality of jobs. And I think often we shortcut that conversation mm -hmm. and really understanding, and I think another sort of research gap I want to throw out into the audience is the shared economy, collaborative economy, technology, post, you know, industrial revolution, where does that take us, the impact between men and women? And I think, again, we have total blank space in yeah. terms of really understanding that. And then just finishing up on the consumer segment, that's something I see has done tons of work on. And I want to just give you one example that ties into the previous conversation around financial assets. An industry that's not much loved, and certainly, surely, probably not in this room, is insurance. Usually, it's obviously bringing out the worst. It's bringing out the worst in the sense the insurers don't trust their claimants, and the claimants don't trust their insurance. Not a perfect setup. Having said that, we see there's huge gaps between obviously women being insured and men being insured, but all of that is anecdotal. So in order to put the business case to the insurance industry, which is pushing heavily into 
unregulated spaces in emerging markets because profit is maximized and growth is stagnant in developed economies, they need to understand who are they insuring, why are they insuring them for, what for, what do women want and need. So we put together a study that's called She for Shield, ensure women to better protect all that sizes the market to be 1.7 trillion alone by 2030 if insurers were really to focus in on what women want and need. But not in a shortcut way, but really designing products and services with women as part of it. So you've all heard human-centered design. We really focus on women-centered design or user-centric design. So you can actually sub-segment really where you're going with your customers <coughs> and your consumers, and you can tailor distribution channels, marketing, and the offerings really to what women and men need, and also what maybe married women need, what actually women need who are single, and for the first time in their life able to actually accumulate assets, they need to be able to protect them. So on the consumer side, tons of work has been done, and the business is case is one of the easiest to make. On the other dimension, like supply chain, it's, it's a lot more hard. Uh, thank you, uh, Henriette. I'm going to ask everyone to sort of park this issue of technology and technological progress. I mm -hmm. think it's a very important one, and I want to come to it at the end. I just wanted to make one comment on something that Henriette said about Sri Lanka and, and aging and so on. Uh, it's not just confined to uh, developing countries, by the way. Mm -hmm. Japan, mm -hmm. the yeah. most aged country in the world, and a country where the population is actually not just aging, it's declining. It has been declining for the last two years. The rate at which it's declining is, is a net decline in population of 350,000 uh, uh, people a year. Um, a colleague of mine likes to say a city the size of Baltimore uh, disappears uh, in Japan every year. They have a highly educated female workforce. They have amongst the lowest female labor force participation rates. They have amongst the tightest, in, in advanced countries, tightest labor markets which means you know, it makes sense to bring women into the labor force. But the struggle there is to how to square both those objectives, bringing more women into the labor force, while also keeping the fertility rate up so that you have a hope of slowing, maybe not reversing the decline, but certainly slowing the decline in population. Mm. So you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very, very tricky issue. And one where if you look at you know, one of the more pessimistic uh, uh, views of Japan is that it might already be too late. But, but um, hopefully other countries don't get to that uh, viewpoint. But let's, let's, I'm, I'm happy to come back to that if you have questions on that later. But let me turn to you, Charles, and ask you, what are the views, your views, on the scope for, the desirability of, the effectiveness of regulation in the private sector to, to promote gender balance? I, I just want to say, there's, before I get to that, and I, it, there's there's one other answer to the Japanese problem beyond yes. uh, raising fertility rates, yes. which is migration, and uh, <laughs> Japan's been terrible on that. Yeah. Yes, um, politi you, politically, uh, politically uh, it's very it's hot potato. complicated potatoes. too. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> anywho, uh, uh, on, on, on regulation, although I, I, mean, I, um, I, I do actually think there is a, a, a big role for the way we regulate uh, migration um, in countries, including the, the, the US, um, uh, and, and, and Europe in terms of improving gender outcomes worldwide. But uh, leaving that aside, I, mean, I think that um, what is clear from what has come before today is that there is an immense opportunity here for making huge progress uh, uh, when it comes to um, the private sector as a, you know, a, a driver for, for uh, women's economic um, empowerment and um, economic equality. I mean, the, the statistic about Walmart from this morning about you know just that one company, twenty billion over the last um, uh, 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 five years, from somewhat increasing the the amount uh, of its uh, supplies that come from uh, from women-owned firms is you know a, a sign of that. Twenty billion is a, is a lot of money. We've just put together a proposal for the United States government to spend one billion year, more a year in aid on on uh, uh, um, women's economic empowerment worldwide. One billion compared to just Walmart doing you know twenty billion over five. I mean, it's it's there's the potential for a huge scale. Obviously, there is also a big role for government to help or hinder that. Um, and the f I mean, the first thing that government can do in a lot of places, um, uh, 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 and I mentioned it briefly, is get out of the way. The, it's amazing the number of countries that have rules <laughs> on the book saying women can't do various things. Um, you know, in Russia, they can't drive trains for some reason. I, I 
don't know why, but anyway, there we are. It's in the World Bank uh, uh, research. It's fa fantastic. Uh, 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 Women, business, and law is a, is a, is a, is a fantastic piece of work. Um, now, I, you know, I think it ought to be in countries. I'm sure we all think that it ought to be in countries' um, own interest to get get rid of those laws. Um, to the extent that there's a, a, a global role, and, and at CGD we spend most of our time thinking about you know, kind of what can uh, 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 rich countries, uh, wealthier countries, do to improve outcomes worldwide. I actually think one thing that wealthy countries like uh, the, the United States and, and, and Europe could do in this area is um, actually push for better standards in uh, uh, by, uh, trade agreements and in, in bilateral investment treaties. Mm -hmm. U.S. bilateral investment treaties, the standard treaty, already has language in it saying firms under bilateral investment treaties should be able to hire senior management, whatever senior management they want, you know, regardless of, sort of local uh, hiring laws and so on. Why not add, and they ought to be able to hire regardless of gender? Just give me one extra little line in there. Um, now, it would only apply to firms under the bilateral investment treaty, right? It wouldn't apply to the vast majority of firms in any country. But still, for those firms, it would apply, and it would help set the precedent that this is the, the way we think the world ought to be done. Um, the last session was about uh, uh, um, uh, financial inclusion. Know your customer regulation, largely being pushed by wealthy countries, and especially the United States are having an insidious effect on access to financial services. And it's an insidious and gendered effect, mm -hmm. um, not least because if you look at the number of women worldwide, um, and uh, uh, well, women worldwide who have uh, uh, um, you know, a formal certification of citizenship, it's lower than men. Mm -hmm. But in particular, children of women born out of wedlock are quite often denied all citizenship rights by countries. And, you know, I mean, that's horrible um, for a whole bunch of reasons. But one of the reasons it's horrible is that they, they, they can't get financial access. I, I don't have a sort of easy fix for how, how uh, we deal with that problem. I do think that the, the international uh, FATF, the, the, the international body that, that puts together rules around things like know your customer, um, should be told that rather than as its current rules are, it can only think about what's going to be the effect of this regulation on uh, uh, terrorism. Ought to be allowed to think, well, might it have bad effects in terms of gender or other development outcomes? And you know, maybe, maybe that would at least help on the margin. Um, then there's uh, 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 another issue that's come up a, a, a lot today um, about um, ownership of, uh, of firms being unclear and that having knock-on effects in terms of things like, can you borrow money? Do you have anything, you know, any security to put up against um, uh, 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 borrowing? Um, you know, Elizabeth mentioned that the, sort of the WeConnect impact, if you will, that because there is now an incentive for firms to be able to say, we are 51% women-owned, more, firm, more women are having the discussion with their partners about who owns what in this firm and, and sort of tying it down so that they can say, yes, we are 51% women owned. I think the, you know, the, 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 the trillion dollar opportunity, which is uh, to, uh, to uh, sell things to the private sector, um, is outweighed by a nine trillion opportunity, which is the amount that governments procure each year. And we ought to be pushing for governments mm -hmm to give a slight incentive, not, not a quota for all the reasons you mentioned, uh, uh, it was suggested before, not, not, a, not a quota saying that it has to be five or 25% of all uh, uh, procurements that go to women-owned firms, but an incentive system. So take the World Bank at the moment. It has rules that say if, firm, if countries uh, want to uh, offer procurement opportunities and give a few extra points in the scoring system for who wins that procurement opportunity to firms from that country, a sort of home country bias, if you will. The World Bank says that's OK. I think the World Bank ought to also say, and by the way, if you want to offer a few extra points um, to women-owned firms, if they can properly demonstrate they are women-owned yeah. firms, um, you know, that's OK by us too. Um, and indeed, you know, encourage countries to, 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 to use that model. Um, we need to get from a place where, and Megan told me that at the moment, the US has finally just about managed to reach 
5% of federal procurement opportunities going to women, 20 years after having set that target. Um, so, you know, I, I don't expect immediate change overnight uh, in, 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 in uh, other countries worldwide, but, you know, maybe we could move toward 5%, 10% uh, in, in the future using that kind of thing. Um, uh, and, and finally, and back again to the, 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 the last session, I mean, there, there was a sort of interesting back and forth about whether banks were, you know, uh, profit maximizing in a sensible way when it came to uh, um, uh, 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 how they were treating potential women customers, if you will. Um, I do think Myra's example of Chile suggests the power of data. And I think there is a huge role for governments um, to be collecting data to help the private sector make economically informed decisions uh, on, on how to market their services. For instance, uh, uh, the breakdown of their own customers uh, in, in, in the banking sector. And there is a role for government regulation to do that. Um, and I think there's a role for institutions, including the IMF uh, and the World Bank, to encourage uh, uh, the collection of that sort of data. Um, so you know, there's clearly a huge role for the private sector to, to improve outcomes. There is clearly a really important role for governments to help them do that. And I think there is a role for governments in other countries to help governments uh, 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 make, make the right decisions. Thank you, Charles. Um, I, one, the couple of things I wanted to pick up on that you said. Um, one criticism that um, we often get, and I think it you know, probably also applies to the World Bank, is that we, um, you know, we, especially the IMF, though, um, we go around prescribing policies to handle um, macroeconomic imbalances. Our goal, remember, the mandate of the IMF is, is macroeconomic and financial stability. But one of the things that we have not done and certainly haven't done consistently is to look at the impact of those policies, which are, of course, aimed at uh, restoring macroeconomic stability and growth, how those policies may or may not have a differential impact on women. Mm -hmm. So we, we are doing work that, on policies that will be good for women. However, what we haven't done, and it's clear to understand this distinction, we are doing work and we do advocate policies that we know are good for women, but we don't necessarily yet make an assessment of the policies that we recommend for other objectives, whether or not they have a differential impact on women, and if they do, what, if anything, can be done about it, right? And it, it, it's, so it's very important, and, and the big missing gap, it's not necessarily an excuse, but it is a reality, is data. So one of the initiatives that we have been pushing uh, along, uh, funded a bit, uh, funded by DFID, is gender budgeting and encouraging mm -hmm. countries to, uh, to undertake gender budgeting. Uh, and, and, and that I would just want to plug to any of you who are interested, Monday, November 7th, there's a conference at the IMF on gender budgeting with a number of practitioners presenting their experiences on adopting uh, gender responsive budgeting and how it, uh, how it works. But let me uh, you turn to um, Arancha and ask you, first of all, talk to us a little bit about progress made in, in embedding gender initiatives in trade agreements and also if there is any evidence at all that that has helped. Well, let me start with your uh, comment about data. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, maybe when we say gender budgeting, it sounds a bit esoteric. Yes. But let me just tell you what it means in concrete terms right. with a very concrete example. And why it matters that we collect this data. Kenya, largest export item is called tea. Tea is, for those of you who don't know it, a male crop. What is a male crop? It's the crop that is sold by the man in the family. And what happens when the man in the family sells the crop? That the revenues from selling the crop is not the same as the revenues which the woman gets when she sells the crops. Because the spending pattern of a man on average worldwide, um, the World Bank says so, so it's not me, you know, just in case you thought that I was pushing my, uh, you know, argument. The spending pattern of a man and of a woman is different. A woman would spend 90% of her revenues into her family community. A man, it would be around 40%. In the tea plantations in central Kenya, you see this with your own eyes. So you start collecting data, and you see that, which is what we did three years ago, that 
the prevalence of poverty, of child, uh, children not going to school, of malnutrition is linked to a crop that is a male crop. So what happens when you change this crop um, and you combine tea with, say, avocado and cashew? Avocado and cashew, not being male crops, are crops that the woman can go to the market and sell for exports, including for exports. So here is a good example of how trade works. Mm. So what happens is that immediately the nutrition goes up, the schooling of the children goes up, the poverty rates go down. Something as simple as what type of crop you plant. So it matters that we get this data. It matters that when budgeting, the state of Kenya understands where the, the state of Kenya is going to be putting the infrastructure, for example, or the support yeah. to the farming communities. So data is essential, and data is not just about abstract data. Data is what will allow us to then drive public and private policies that make sense. Now, once we have this data, I've long argued that one group of public policymakers that don't necessarily use this data are trade negotiators. Mm -hmm. They don't necessarily negotiate trade agreements, understanding when they craft their offensive and defensive interests. For those of you who've been uh, trade negotiators, you always have to have, you know, what am I going to push for and what am I going to push against? So when you craft your trade offensives and defensives, you need to understand what's, this, what's the structure of your economy, right? You need to, to understand who is in the big companies, who is in the small companies, who is in the micro, who is in the medium, in which sectors. Is it in services? Is it in goods? Is it in agriculture? And on that basis, you introduce the gender dimension in your trade policies. Mm -hmm. So it's not about having trade rules that are specifically crafted for women. Frankly, I don't think we want rules of origin for women mm -mm. <laughs> in business compared to men in business. It's what we want is trade policies that are sensitive to where the women are in your economy. So data matters. Gold standard uh, for someone that is moving in that direction, uh, check uh, the recently concluded agreement between Uruguay and Chile. They have a chapter on gender and trade not a chapter on SMEs of which you know women are part of. They have a chapter on gender and trade. Mm -hmm. And in this chapter, both these countries are saying, we care about women in our economy. We care about empowering women through trade. And this is why we are going to, from now on, do the following. So a gold standard for me in this area is uh, the agreement between Uruguay and Chile. Let me add to this. Uh, all of this uh, being part of uh, an initiative we have uh, launched last year called She Trades, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, which, again, we want all of you to run with. It's not our initiative, it's a world initiative to connect one million women to markets by 2020, but more importantly, a program of action <coughs> to act upon data, trade policies. There are many others, but let me choose another one and give you a gold standard also. Public procurement. Mm. I was just in Chile last week. You will think that it's all about Latin America. It's a coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> what has Chile done? I was in Chile a year and a half ago uh, in a conference that uh, President Bachelet, together with Ban Ki-moon, hosted on women's economic empowerment, women's empowerment, mm -hmm. of which the economy was a little part. But it so happens that uh, in po as part of this conversation, the head of the procurement office of Chile listened to this conversation and said, hey, I can't do something on public procurement. So she went to her finance minister, finance ministries, mm. not just gender ministries, finance ministries, knocked at the door and said, what if we were to give a bit of a plus plus in our scoring system to those that procure from women or from uh, indigenous populations or from disabled communities because this has a social impact? Not because we want to be nice, but because it has a social impact. So they changed the legislation, not a quota. They did not like the idea that we needed mm -hmm. a quota. They preferred a scoring system in which they would give a plus plus. But they didn't stop there. Second thing they realized is they needed to qualify those women in business. Who are these women in mm -hmm. business? So the state, the government, the procurement office of the finance ministry has come up 
with a stamp that certifies who is a woman in business. They've taken the registry of unipersonal companies. They have a registry for this, right? Every, every government has. And they've said this automatically qualified stamp of approval. And now they are in the process of approving those companies that are shareholding companies. The state is doing this. Why? Because like this, they lower the entry costs for women in business to be part of this market, which otherwise is off limits. I was there last week, and you had amazing examples. The mayor of a little town in the south of Chile who procures now, understanding that he can procure and embed women. You had the defense ministry saying, we too want to co cooperate. The public works, we too, we want to do it. So this is what a gold standard looks like in public procurement, embedding women into this vast uh, market, as Charles says. It's $15 trillion a year, and less than this 1% of this market is today supplied by women in business. All of this to say it's perfectly doable. Yeah. I guess it's uh, too recent an experience to see if it's, if it's had an impact yet, but, but, but we, we believe it will have an impact, so, so I'm happy to wait and see. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Henriette, uh, can you, from your experience, give us, try and make it a little bit real for this audience and give us one example of innovation in the private sector that can help address uh, women's, um, you know, especially gaps in assets, which I know is a subject that you care about. Yeah, I, I do in a minute. I just want to piggyback for a second also on what you've said on Chile. What we've done in the um, conference on the multilateral development bank conference looking mm. at procurement the one other example that came out and i think there could be links is the whole impact that transparency has mm. that's right. in terms of female vis-a-vis -vis male bidders and dominican republic has totally yeah. revitalized no it's um, procurement policies and how they're really going about it uh, making it much more transparent and digitally accessible mm -hmm. so looking at potentially linking the open governance uh, op open governance initiative actually with the procurement agenda and gender equality might be sort of an easy win that I think has yet been underexplored. So going Agreed. back to them, I think, could be something that we could follow up on. Um, but yeah, to make it very practical, so i give you one example in Latin America, and then just to be a bit more <laughs> diverse, one from the Middle East, and I start with that. So Lebanon, obviously, you know, huge influx of refugees from Syria, really a challenging market for any bank to operate in. Um, so we've been working for a very long time with the Bank of Lebanon, and there's one, to your point, in terms of the government needs to get out of uh, some of the regula regulations. There's a law in the books that says women cannot open bank accounts in the name of their children. Mm. So that poses a huge problem because a lot of women are either single or widowed or um, are you know, unable to get the consent of her husband. And so kids have no bank accounts. And so the way Bank of Lebanon went around it is they really designed an offering that actually helped mothers to open bank accounts for their kids without changing the overall law. So what IFC did was, first of all, to help the bank understand, OK, start with the basics. How many women-owned enterprises are you banking? OK, you're only banking 12%. But surprise, we have 35% of formally registered businesses are women entrepreneurs. Where are they banking? Mm. Well, we don't know where they're banking. So we're like, well, why don't you find out where they were banking? They were mostly banking with their relatives. They weren't banking with the former mm. sector at all, which, of course, is very common um, and not a big surprise. In the Middle East, more common than in some other regions. So we said, look, there's money sitting around that you could easily tap into. But because you're not really targeting women entrepreneurs um, specifically and building out customer value propositions where they bundle products as well, um, you actually could make this work for you. And so four years fast forward, now they have a return on investment of over 35%. Mm. Um, huge amounts of um, progress. NPL rates are equally and in some cases lower than their male counterparts. So that business case that we've sort of talked about before is very clearly there and can be sort of captured. Now we've had fantastic partners in them that they were very open about their data because they were the first market mover in a relatively small market. Mm -hmm. Other companies we work with, they don't necessarily want to advertise how many women don't enterprise their banking compared to their male counterparts because they feel that's an insight that is market intelligence for their competition. Mm -hmm. So just to say that it isn't always as easy to come out with these figures in public, but Bank of Lebanon clearly has done that. Another sort of, um, I think, new approach of designing customer value propositions in the financial sector is using a lot of behavioral economics and human-centered design. I briefly mentioned that. 
Banco Leon in Dominican Republic. We've worked with them both on the investment and the advisory side and helped them mystery shop alongside their customers and design solutions, not just on financing, but crossing into the insurance space mm -hmm. that helps women entrepreneurs. Because mm -hmm. often we, or banks, tend to approach you either as a caregiver or as a business owner or as a mother or as a widow or whatever it may be, but they're not really looking at the life cycle. So instead of segmenting you as you are a woman entrepreneur, therefore you have no collateral and therefore you need this, to say no, you have got care needs, you've got business needs, you've got children responsibility, you've all kinds of situations that you need to deal with and here's our product bundle. That's the type of innovation I think that's working. But maybe just to finish up, to give one example that maybe people don't associate IFC with is these are all individual firm level interventions. And we could spend the next 50 years going around from one company to the next, to the next. And really it takes a huge amount of effort and time. So we also look at sort of what are innovations that really can be done across a sector or across you know, peer to peer learning between companies. So one thing we've recently done is launched a tackling childcare partnership. I know it's sad that it's 2016 and we're still talking about the issue of care. But it feel like the private sector has not yet fully realized what the return of investment is in providing access to quality childcare, and in particular in those regions where the government isn't there. Women business and the law tells us beautifully, women's labor force participation clearly is much higher, whether it's government subsidized care mm -hmm. or provided care. But in many regions we work in, there is no government to be seen in pre-K or in preschool, and so what does the private sector do in absence of that? They could throw up their hands, they could do it badly, or they could actually team up with a whole suite of private sector partners and early childcare specialists and think around sustainable care models that really sort of triangulate <coughs> household responsibilities, government responsibilities with the private sector. And you've just seen sort of, you know, Daimler's done it, and you know, lots of examples, Standard Chartered, Barclays, and so on. But it hasn't really arrived at the level where we need it to be in order to move key barriers out of the way that really do stop both men and women to be as productive in the labor force as they might want to be. And so I think looking at the tackling childcare space is something that the private sector is only just starting to, to really um, focus on. And where we can help is put together the business case and what does best practice look like. There's uh, there, we, have a, we have a few minutes. So let me take some questions from the floor. and. Um, and please identify yourself, questions short, and yeah, uh, starting from there, yeah. Mike coming. Hi, Wade Channel from USAID. Um, thanks for the emphasis on points, incentives, et cetera, for changing the buying habits or business habits. I was wondering, Henriette, if you could discuss a little bit, and I don't know if it's in your shop or elsewhere at IFC, but I've recently learned of um, IFC using social audits of, of, company, of borrowers uh, to affect the terms of the loans that they get. So the, some of this is a gender impact in what's going on, and, and we're beginning to kick around ideas of we're increasingly getting evidence that uh, certain structures, levels of women in upper management, et cetera, have an impact on viability, mm -hmm. uh, level of uh, violence or harassment in the work, work shape, workplace has an impact on viability. Could you talk a little bit about, or any of you, the thought of turning that into a risk-weighted item that could eventually be something that not only we in the donor community ask of our banks that we're lending to, but we get banks mm -hmm. in Basel mm -hmm. and others mm -hmm. to recognize mm -hmm. this is a risk issue. Why isn't it part of our calculus? Mm -hmm. Very good question. Are we, are we gathering a few? Uh, let's gather a few. One more here. Hello, my name is Alejandro Garcia from uh, Vital Voices. I'm the director of m &E. So I'm very happy to hear all the data-driven conversations. And with that, my question is, I know that we need evidence. We need to be able to track our impacts. We need to be able to provide that evidence to our donors, to the population at large, to the public policy makers. And with that, are your organizations working towards increasing the capacity of how to read data, how to incorporate a gender lens into the data that's already existing, and how to collect that in a better and more effective way as well? 
Uh, two, two more here in the front row, and then we'll take, and then we'll. Um. Um, Barbara Kermgold at the Institute for Alternative Futures. I mean, I've worked in health policy, and in recent years, there's been use of something modeled with the idea of the environmental impact assessment to do health impact assessment on non-health policies, that is, policies or programs whose primary uh, objective is not to have a health outcome. And I wonder if something like that has been considered or could be of use um, in, in trade or in contracts with banks or financial institutions or whatever, a gender impact assessment that would look at the impact the, of the change on, on, on gender. In I'm Deirdre LePin. I'm a uh, corporate uh, responsibility consultant, a former staff member of the IFC. Um, I'm interested in the big data to try to encourage more uh, women's uh, owned companies uh, for procurement purposes. Um, once you know who is a women owned company, you can identify them, you have to pull them into the process. And so I'm wondering you know, what steps you see uh, can be taken in order to do that. And it's rather parallel to the steps that a lot of companies are taking to indigenize procurement, mm -hmm. for example, in, mm -hmm. in other companies. They, they sometimes have to bend over backwards to change their procurement rules and processes. So what do you see as, as a good way of approaching this issue? Thank you. OK, let me, let me um, Arantxa, do you want to start? Sure. Let me start with this last one, uh, because this is something that uh, uh, Chile, obviously, when doing uh, their model, uh, had very much in mind. It starts with uh, the fact that the country has fully automatized its procurement process. It's all fully online. It's all fully transparent. And this is where the conversation should start. It shouldn't start from the gender lens, but it should start with make your public procurement fully transparent, because it's like this that you will know how to use this for public policy uh, purposes. So what they have is you qualify once. You don't have to qualify for every tender that you uh, uh, want to uh, participate in. You have the stamp that qualifies you as a woman in business. You are into the system, and it's one system that procures, that is used to procure at all levels in the state, where it's a municipality procuring, whether it's a province procuring, whether it's the defense ministry procuring, where there's the public's work procuring, they all use the same platform. Mm -hmm. So technology, transparency, a one-stop shop, cutting down the costs of transacting, and then you have women in there. And it's not that they are now road testing this. It's, as I told you, we, we had in this conference last week, lots of individual companies saying, I, you know, the, the mayor of the city saying, I now procure from these women. Now, all of this was done, Ministry of Finance, all the procurement entities in the country, and, and very important, with the Association of Women in Business in the country mm -hmm. that are working to capacitate the women, the women to be suppliers to the state in whichever form. Uh, second, uh, on this uh, risk weighting, so to speak. Listen, there are companies that have changed their reporting, their corporate reporting. They have to stop reporting uh, profit and losses every quarter, every half a year. They've decided to do this in a different way. Which different way? With a longer term lens in mind. So this whole thing is, this debate is about criteria for the short term versus criteria for the long term. Yeah. And if it's a criteria for the long term, then it's about sustainability, whether it's environmental sustainability, whether there is inclusiveness, whether there is social sustainability, and the list goes on. So my advice to you is, yes, push like hell. The place to push is called Basel. And if you push this topic, please also push the know your customer criteria, because it's part of the same universe. Uh, data collection, uh, very briefly, uh, and big data, what we have done uh, in the International Trade Center uh, in order to get to the one million women who want to connect to markets by 2020. This is not what the IPC will be doing only. is what we want partners to do. 
And when you agree to work with us to connect women, you agree to put your data in a system. You sign and you put your data on the system. And this data is transparent and available to everybody. So it has to be with this idea that we are checking. We are not just making promises, but we are checking, not just because there is a donor asking for us to check, but because we want to get to the one million women connected to markets. And yet. Um, just, I'm just commenting on Wade's quick question in terms of what's the ISC doing on social auditing. Indeed, we have started, in particular in the garment sector, um, to link sort of social audits with then short-term trade supply chain financing. Um, and that's pointing us into sort of a more experimental field. We haven't broadened it out yet. And I think there's definite, um, to, to Arantia's point, definite gains to be made. And I think we should be pushing into that direction. There's still another couple of MDBs who are taking it further and incentivizing um, companies with base percentage points for hiring more women in male-dominated sectors. Now, I think it'll be interesting to see what impact that has. It's very early days. I think you could run the huge challenge of actually having short-term recruitment drives where you get a better loan percentage base point and then you actually jeopardize you know, long-term um, outcomes for women and sort of make short-term gains to obviously assess and obtain better financial conditions. So I think that could be probably backfiring, but it's too early to say. It'll be interesting to see how that pans out. And I think Elevate here in the US is doing some really great work on, on that. And I think looking at their rating system is helping us learn a bit as to how are they doing that on the domestic side. So I think it's, it's hugely important if we want to make transformational change. That's the way to go. Otherwise, I think we are kind of, you know, doing a little bean, bean counting. <laughs> yeah. Charles. Um, just on the uh, de gender impact assessment, it kind of comes back to the gender budgeting thing. And I, I, I am cautious on this stage. <laughs> you know, I think there are people who understand much more about gender budgeting than I do. Um, uh, I think this is a case where what me gets measured uh, gets done is yep. kind of sometimes true, but not yeah. nearly <laughs> always. Um, and, and so, I mean, Australia, for example, yes. introduced gender budgeting and kind of dropped it uh, because it didn't seem to be having you know, quite a lot of work to do and didn't seem to be having too much of an impact on outcomes. Um, a, 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 a visiting uh, f fellow here uh, 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 um, who used to be a uh, finance minister of Nigeria um, introduced gender budgeting that worked, if you will, and it wasn't full-scale gender budgeting, but yeah, it was basically, hey, Ministry of Health, I'll give you more money yeah. if you do some things that you can demonstrate have uh, you know, extra impact on women. I think if you if you link the measurement mm. with the incentive, then by golly, gender budgeting will work. Uh, and so I'd, 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 I'd love to see some of that. Um, uh, uh, and, and there may be examples of them. I, I, I'd love to hear more. Um, uh, uh, and just to sort of follow up on the, on, on the procurement point in Arantia, um, uh, a topic close to my heart. Uh, I, th I think it's absolutely true that um, if, you, um, <laughs> if you combine an incentive around um, you know, a few extra points in the scoring system on, uh, uh, for, for women-owned businesses when it comes to which firm is selected, with a system that makes it way easier to um, uh, 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 bid in the first place, you get results. And to take a non-Latin American example, uh, Slovakia, a couple of years ago, introduced um, open contracting, which involves the full text of the contract is published. All the bids are on, you know, all the bid documentation is online. Ev everything's online, but you know, all the way through the process, everything is online so that firms can look at the previous contract and go, oh, right, that's what I'm bidding for. It massively reduces the barriers to entry for new firms no one, yeah. to bid for the first time on government work. And that's what we really need if we're going to get more uh, women-owned firms involved. I don't know, and I now really want to find out, uh, uh, what percentage of the new firms that are bidding were women-owned firms. Um, I, I think the data would allow us to discover the answer mm -hmm. to that question. I do know that the average number of bids on a government procurement exercise went up by one, which may not sound like that much, but you know, over a few million government procurements a year, it adds up to a lot of extra bids. And so I, I think that's a really important part of the process. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take one last question, and then we'll wrap up. You had a question? It's more of a comment, if I can, and not just this panel, but thank you for this panel. I really enjoyed. I, I, it's a challenge to the gender field, because if we're going to talk about gender inequality, equality in the economy, I really do think we have to combine gender analysis with 
the analysis of where people are in the economy, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. And so we have begun a discussion with the women business and the law, the mm -hmm. WeGo Network on the informal, which is that if you're uh, an informal women worker, it's not just the family law that yeah. affects you. It is administrative and public law mm -hmm. and all of that that affects you, right? right? We also have a tool called informal economy budget analysis, which looks at economic side of the equation, both the revenue and the expenditure. And we found in Accra, Ghana, that in one of the municipalities, a lot of the internally generated revenue was actually from the street vendors and the market traders, but they were getting nothing back. No public right? services. So yeah. I think we have to close that loop and not just do gender analysis, but look at where women and men, small, medium, large, in are in the economy yeah. and do that that sort of, it's, I don't know if it's class and gender, but something in gender, yeah. not just gender, yeah. um, right? Yeah. And for procurement, I just want to give the example of the waste pickers, mm. right? Yeah. And um, it took an activist constitutional court in Colombia mm -hmm to rule three, four times that the waste picker organizations had the right to bid for solid waste management contracts. It took a left ex-guerrilla mayor to honor that bid. He had to deprivatize the waste management. Over $1 billion in contracts have been given over eight years to private companies. He took back some of that. And 10,000 waste pickers are now being paid for their waste picking and sorting, which the private companies don't sort, right? And there's a national ruling that it should be replicated, the model, across Colombia, right? So we have to get beyond just gender, 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 because not all women are the same. And, what, yeah. and we have to add in, if we're talking economy, the informal as well as gender. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Uh, so yeah, I, absolutely. We didn't get much to discussing where the occupational uh, distribution of women, uh, although you did talk a little bit about small enterprises and so on, uh, some of which may be, in fact, informal. Um, uh, two things. One is on gender budgeting, the point that Charles made. Um, there's a study that we've done uh, uh, on across Indian states and looking at whether gender outcomes differ when there is gender-focused, bu gender-responsive budgeting. And you're absolutely right. I don't think it, I, I think it's very difficult to say that when you do just the act of doing gender responsive budgeting gives rise to better outcomes. In fact, the, it's very difficult to establish that causality. It, it is, in fact, much more complicated. It, it is sometimes just a policymaker realizing that they need to do this and then putting in place the tools that they need to do it, of which gender budgeting is one. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you have outcomes that come out of that, generally better outcomes. But which came first, the yeah. chicken or the egg, so to speak? The other thing I just, we, just, we do have to close. I want to challenge you all, in, and all of us too, when we think about our work in this area going forward. The, there is a massive amount of technological change going on, and mm -hmm. has been going on in which uh, a number of uh, sort of blue collar, brawn intensive jobs, if you wish, are being automated. And, and there's some even discussion that maybe even the white collar, brain intensive jobs are being gonna be taken over by artificial intelligence and so on, but that, that we may not be there yet. What we are definitely looking at is a, is a, is a landscape where the jobs mm -hmm. of the future are going to be less obviously uh, gender, um, uh, I mean, less obvious where you know, men may have a comparative advantage. And if the losses that we, have, we can calculate of leaving half your labor force mm -hmm. or more out or, or um, not giving them a level playing field, they, those are the losses that we have been calculating the IMF and putting in front of uh, policymakers saying your macroeconomic losses by leaving out half your talent pool is such and such. Just imagine what the losses will be when there isn't an obvious, uh, when the talent distribution is going to probably no longer favor one group because of some physical attributes. Uh, and I think, we, I think that could be another very, very powerful angle 
to policymakers to say they need to think very differently about how men and women are uh, used in wherever they are in the economy um, for economic growth going forward. But thank you all very much. Please join me in thanking our panelists for an extremely interesting panel. And I'm just going to take the opportunity to, to, to close out the day very briefly. Um, I, I hope you found this as fascinating as I, I did. Clearly, you know, wow, there's a big, there's a big uh, uh, hill to climb with uh, sort of 1% uh, 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 of women being uh, uh, employers compared to 3% of men, um, you know, one trillion dollar markets with 1% going to women-owned firms and so on. But that also means there's this huge opportunity. And it was so, so nice to hear today about you know, what CWA is doing, what Walmart is doing, the sort of the role for digital solutions, uh, 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 the, the, the role for digital solutions in, in financial inclusion and so on. Um, uh, you know, a, a, a hopeful, um, if huge, uh, agenda. Um, and so thank you to uh, all of the panelists uh, and, 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 and moderators uh, for bringing that forward. I need to add thanks um, to the CGD gender team. Um, a lot of you in this room will know uh, how lucky I am to get to work with Myra uh, uh, on these issues. Um, there is nobody who could have, uh, nobody better to take a, a neophyte like me and, and make me slightly less embarrassingly ignorant on these subjects. Um, fewer, but I bet a lot of you will know how lucky I am to work with Megan, um, uh, who uh, organized this completely, pretty much, uh, uh, from beginning to end, and I think did a fantastic job, so thank you, Megan. Um, and the... Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Amanda and the team, thank you very much for uh, all the organization. And now all that is left to do is for you all to go out back there and have a drink and uh, continue the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you.